What's up, everyone? It is Sunday night, and we are at Bat City, which means it must be time to wind down your weekend talking about this week's awesome comics. As always, I'm your host, Small Press Ann, and with me today, somebody a little different. We've got our curriculum coordinator for Bat City, Zach Suckleman, in from Nashville. Yes, I know. Let's clap and applaud. Uh, you you clap for yourself. <laughs> I was clapping for Nashville. Yay, Nashville! <laughs> I do. I have always had good experiences in that airport yeah. and the city. Um, yes, yeah, Zach has been here with us this week. We're going to talk about why in just a second. But as always, we want to kick it off with tasting this wine, which you picked. I did. Uh, what's it called? What do you got? It's called, I think it's Pickside. Or Pickside. Pickside has a, the little accent on the I. Right. Um, and it's a Tempranillo from Spain. Ooh. All right. Well, let's taste it. It's a 2019. Cheers. Good Cheers. Cheers. Yeah. Mmm, mm. yeah. mm, mm. that is really nice. Yeah, I like that. Good pick. Thank That's you. That's not as spicy. I'm gonna send this to Phil, who's in there. It's not as spicy as a usual Tempranillo. I know no. usually we get the Tempranillos, and they kind of like feel like you drink some pepper with your wine. They've got a punch to them. This yeah. is definitely a lot smoother of a Tempranillo uh, than I've ever had. Yeah, it's almost it almost tastes more Cab Sav than Tempranillo. Mm-hmm. And this is, they say it's a local sustainable vineyard, so Ooh. nice for that. And it's hand-picked grapes in boxes, ensuring maximum aroma, flavor, and color. It definitely has a really strong color. We've been getting wines recently where, like, we got a Pinot Noir last week, and it was super light. And I was like, what, what, is, what is this? Like, I've never seen a light yeah. Noir before. Like, it's, it goes against the very name of the wine, so. Oh, yeah, I guess Noir is, is what stands for <laughs> dark and, yeah, black. <laughs> yeah, I was expect that. So, um, well, this is great. You picked great. Uh, Thank you. Tempranillos are your favorite? What are your favorite wines? I'm a Malbec guy, Malbec but guy. I wanted to get a, a wine that the three of, the, all of us could enjoy. No offense, yes. Phil. I know that you're not a big wine drinker, but. <laughs> Don't that, spoil the illusion. We'll we, Phil loves wine. What are you talking about? <laughs> um, well, if you watch the show, you see him take a ton of sips. No, comparatively speaking. <laughs> um, no, I, I wanted to get something that I know that all of us would enjoy. And Malbec's on the sweeter side. I know you guys, uh, you guys like sweet, but not too sweet. Not too sweet. This is like, this is good. And it does have a little bit of the like after kick, but not... Like I said, not as strong as a normal no, Tempranillo. definitely not. So, um, all right. Well, we got you here. Yeah. So, if you don't know, Bad City is a 501c3 nonprofit organization, and the proceeds from money spent in our store and donations and uh, grants or gifts or anything like that go towards us helping reach our goals, which is to help children explore their creativity and also improve their reading and writing through comics education. So we create curriculums for reading programs. Um, we do a lot of really cool uh, writing workshops and we have resources for teachers. We do educator seminars and we've got a lot of really cool things that Zach and I have been talking about this weekend and things we're going to be building up, not just for in-store, but in the community and I know if you if you've been following us and you were in Austin you've had probably had us come out to your school either for a story time or a book talk or a workshop whether it was for your students or your educators um, or hopefully your school was a recipient of some of our free books that we gave away uh, in the last couple of years but we're very excited to be bringing that to Bradenton and uh, this weekend we had a comic writing workshop yeah, for young kids yeah. yeah but um, you know we had a, a lot of fun. We made some comics. We had we had a quick geography. We lesson did. In we the did. We learned like, about the Gulf of Mexico. We learned about all the things that border the Gulf of Mexico. Yeah. <laughs> um, I learned the entire plot of every season of Stranger Things. That's true. You so did. <laughs> um, everything I didn't know, which we, I, I which was all of it. Um, I now know like predictions for how it could end and how our our writing workshop members would end it if they could end it their way. Um, yeah, a lot of detail known about the. Kind of scary Stranger Things from a seven-year-old yeah. who's telling us like exactly all the details, and I'm like, you, you watch that, okay? You, and you paid attention, and that's why we do the workshops with pop culture Absolutely. because we know that kids love their pop culture. Oh, a hundred percent. And you know what, Zach? Since you're here, and people won't get to see you face to face all the time, why don't you kind of tell them what your background is and why yeah. you're excited to be a part of helping out? Yeah, I mean, so I. I've been uh, a teacher, I've been uh, you know, an educator and a learning scientist for quite some time. I have my 
PhD in developmental psychology. So my entire background is really about how young kids develop, but also how we can get young kids to learn the best they can and um, with a specific focus on literacy and language learning. And so, um, you know, I'm, I'm really excited at the opportunity to get to work with this wonderful group of people um, who are not only, you know, inspirations to me, but my friends. And so it's going to be a lot of fun. I think we have some really great ideas, not only for the Bradenton community, but for the potential to expand into a digital space that we can offer classes and workshops and different formats um, across the nation for people who are interested, because I think we both agree that, you know, comic book literature is often underrepresented within not only like young kids classrooms, but across the mm-hmm. education system, despite a lot of the potential for the the literacy and language opportunities that can come from reading comic books, from talking about comic books, and from just like learning how to work with comic books. Yeah, I just, I was doing some studying recently, and I was looking at just the idea of curriculum development over the course of the entirety of America and the very first two curriculums ever established for schools were using comic books and it was a very big thing that comics were a part of the original education curriculums that were devised for the standards so those standards that we talk about now those common cores and your teaks and your standardized testing all focused in including comic books in the very first curriculums that our, our country ever used and so To be able to get to a time where we're bringing that back, and I know so many teachers who are just doing a wonderful job of that, teachers and librarians both who are already doing a wonderful job, but to be able to add on to and give them the resources to make it even easier for them to do it and to make it easier for parents. We have a lot of things lined up for what we want to do to help parents Parents, have those conversations and help with that. Yeah, absolutely, because, you know, especially what a lot of the developmental literature would tell us and the research and science would tell us is that especially for those younger kids, the first literacy experiences with their parents can be what sets the standard for the rest of their literacy careers, quote unquote. So if they have a positive um, fruitful experience early on that involves like enthusiasm and a dialogue with their parents, they can become lifelong readers just off of that. Um, but sometimes it takes that little nudge from people like us and experts who can, you know, very sensitively and and really respectfully give them the kind of nudge or the materials needed to really enhance their kids' literacy careers and hopefully benefit them in the long run in an academic, but also just in a general sense. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, now I have to do one more thing before you before you switch to the back side of the camera. Don't tell them the trick. (laughs) If you had to recommend one book right now. On the shelves or previously come out, just one book right now to people that they, one comic that they should have read or should be reading, what are you throwing out there? Uh, I know that's the worst question. Yeah, that is a hard about. question. I think I probably would go broad with anything that Tom Taylor is writing right now because I think that he's doing a lot of really important work specifically with like Superman, Son of Kal-El mm-hmm. with like proper representation of sexuality, of gender identity and discussing it in a very kind of appropriate way that isn't super challenging for a younger reader, but also isn't super, um, you know, uh, uh, inf- infantilizing for an older reader. But I mean, I have to go with his Nightwing run is just like, really stellar for me him plus bruno redondo's work on Mm -hmm. art um and as we were talking about the other day it's like again i'm not trying to cause any fights in the comments or in (laughs) any sense but like i truly believe that dick and barbara are end game are the true loves of one another um and so having that run really bring back the joy of their relationship and not put it through like a ton of strife has been just like the joy of my heart to be reading right now. And you know, Dick Dick's not too too difficult on the eyes. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, I would also like to say that I am trying to stir up drama in the comments. So if you are a like <laughs> team Corey or team Babs, like I actually want to hear. Like, do you think Dick goes better with Starfire or do you think he goes better with Batgirl? I, I wanna know. We we we've been told we don't talk politics here, 
by people who of course. Uh, we have a, a customer who's a huge Mary Jane fan and you and I are both Gwen Stacy through and through. We are Gwen, through Gwen purists. And yes. I, I tried to have an argument with him one time and he said, Shannon, you're not profit. We don't discuss politics here. <laughs> and uh, that's always been our yeah. thing from then on when we try to get into the like, which one do you like better? It's like, okay, well technically we don't discuss politics, yeah. but I do want to know because um, I'm always curious to see what everybody's favorites are. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, I'm I'm always going to be reading Spider-Man, but if I were to recommend something to somebody right now, it would probably be Nightwing. Sweet. Yeah. Awesome. Um, if you were in the store, you probably saw Zach this weekend, but you will see Zach's face on a lot of videos coming up soon. Um, educators, we're going to have a lot of videos that you can use in your classroom coming your way, and um, hopefully a lot of Zoom experiences and live videos with Zach. And also like downloadable and material mm -hmm. kind of content that you yeah. can just use in whatever way you see fit. Obviously, we're here, but we also know that it's not always easy to get to the store or to, to log on even for a 30-minute session. So. Yeah. Definitely, you will hopefully be seeing me a lot more, not only, obviously, in the videos, but here, too. Yes, that's what I'm hoping for. Fingers <laughs> crossed. Well, thank you. Thank you of for course. coming this weekend. I'm going to take thank my you. wine. Yes, take your wine, please. And uh, if you uh, haven't met Zach, I hope you guys get a chance to meet Zach. Now I'm going to bring back Phil, and, or bring out Phil, the usual co-host of the night Wednesday Phil is going to join me and we're going to talk about some events coming up we're going to talk about some comics and I might sucker Phil into trying this wine um, <laughs> now that he's back on the show I will actually just hand you the wine because you know I can't have things that can spill next to me um, so just so you know the comments are definitely leaning team Babs so if Good. it makes you feel better uh, Nigel actually said team team Batgirl uh, Tally Die so uh just so we know. But, all right, so we got some stuff coming up. Yes. Some big, huge, huge announcements that I guess we technically announced recently, but if you forgot or you didn't catch last week's show, uh, Andrea Muti is going to be here this Saturday as a part of our Batastic Halloween. I am so excited. Huge. If you know Bat City, you know that we're huge Bunny Mask fans as a store. Uh, Matt used to put a copy of the Free Comic Bouté Bunny Mask in every single bag for every <laughs> single person that was over the age of like 15. Um, and we love it. We love Maniac of New York. Um, I cannot get over the way he manipulates the art on Parasomnia right now for Dark Horse. Um, a Legacy of Violence was just a killer for, literally, a uh, killer first issue. Uh, he is absolutely phenomenal artist. We're so excited to have uh, Andrea coming out this week. He is going to be here on Saturday during our Batastic Halloween um, from 12 to 3. The event's from 11 to 4. If you want to meet Andre come from 12 to 3. He's going to be doing signings. Uh, we do have copies of Bunny Mask, First Prince of Issue 1. We've got some trades of Bunny Mask Volume 1 and some trades of Volume 1 of Maniac of New York. Uh, we've got, we just found an Issue 1, uh, first printing of Prayer Somnia Volume 1, Issue 1 today. Yes. So, and I think Matt got, uh, we got in more copies of Legacy of Violence Issue 1, which is sold out most places. So... Really? Um, we do have more. We sold out of it within like the first two days, and I'm so excited that we have more copies to to not only put back on the shelf, but just to have for this signing. So um, he does have a CGC option, so if you want to get it CGC verified, like that is going to be an option that you can do while you're here. Um, but other than that, if you are like I'm not into signings, I'd love to meet a creator. I believe he's doing. Is he doing remarks? He's doing remarks too, right? Yes. Yes. So which I'm, Matt's going to cry. I just want you all to know that Matt's going to cry. $10 quick remarks. $10 quick. Yes. Oh, my God. $10 quick remarks. I mean, you can't pass that up. You, it's 10 bucks. It's 10 bucks. Yeah. And Andre is going to draw. Oh, oh so an this artist is. artist of his caliber, too. Right. And amazing line work. Oh, my gosh. This is going to be phenomenal. So you have to come meet him. But if you just want to come and enjoy stuff, there is something for all. It, or if you're like, I have children, and that's not Bunny Mask isn't necessarily like the books you get for kids. We have a ton of stuff going on. At 1130, we are going to have a special uh, spooky story time with a special guest reader. Um, we are going to have face painting throughout the day. We are going to have... Um, <laughs> 
Oh my gosh, we're going to have free comics. We're going to have candy for like trick or treat. If you are an adult and you come in a costume, there's going to be a costume contest. I will post the time for that this week because I don't think I've actually posted time for the costume contest. If you are a, you're, you're a kid and you come in a costume, you're just going to get a prize um, just for showing up and being awesome and wearing your costume. And um, there is going to be all kinds of who knows what else going on. Uh, and I believe we are, what was that? Oh, yes, Mez Games is going to be here. They're actually co-hosting with us. They're coming out. Mez Games is going to have a Pokemon out here. They're going to have, I think they're going to set up a tent in the front, um, and they'll have all their Pokemon, like, tables and things like that set up. Um, and then we, I believe, are going to see the return of Geek Sweets. I think it'll be uh, Geek Sweets Cookies. We'll, we'll be out with some, some special treats that you can purchase so, that are going to be themed to, like, Halloween and stuff. I'm super excited. It's going to be a fun event, and the best part is it's free to come. It's free to participate in most of those things. Really, the only thing you'd have to pay for is if you want a signature, and the fact that it's it's $5, I think, for the signature if it's non-witnessed, um, and 10 for those remarks, that's insane. Like, you got you to gotta do it. You got to do it. Yeah, you can't say no to that. No. <laughs> and I, I mean, I assume it's the, whatever the CGC normal, is it that just the 50 bucks? No, he's got a separate fee. We're working that out. Yeah, we're, oh, okay. we're figuring okay. all that. But it's going to be a thing. I'm excited. Um, I can't wait. I really, I'm, I'm, I'm freaking out. Like, it's going to be such a cool event. Um, and just to have, like, our special, like, story time. I'm so excited about this. I cannot wait. Um, it's going to be so much fun. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. That's coming up this weekend. Um, if you and then the week after, uh, the first Saturday of the month is always YA Cafe. So if you are uh, thirteen to nineteen and you're looking for a place to go talk about nerd stuff, um, talk about books, grab a free book while you're there. You can actually come in. We're gonna have some some breakfast goodies available for the teenagers to come in and hang out in the classroom and just talk about stuff that they are enjoying. Um, I did tell a kid today, if everybody's cool and they've all seen stuff, they're welcome to talk about like most recent episodes of shows. They just have to check with each other before they throw down spoilers. Um, and we'll shut the door and they can go spoiler crazy if they want for everybody, <laughs> if everybody's cool with it. Um, so super excited for that. And then the second Saturday of every month is superhero story time. So um, coming up, obviously, in a couple of weeks, we're going to have another superhero superhero story time super excited i love superhero story time it takes place on the ninja turtles rug it's a lot of fun um we have just been loving getting to be a part of this community uh we got to go out to the nighttime friendly city flea last night um which is the local flea market done at Ascura. it was so great they do this is the first nighttime market that they've had back since covid um and it runs six to ten so we were able to pop over right after we closed yesterday um which was super cool uh, great to see all the vendors, get to know everybody, and then there was like crazy fun DJ party happening inside. So, uh, if you haven't been over to Oscura and you're in Bradenton, you should definitely be checking them out. Uh, coffee in the morning, incredible food. Matt and I got to have some of the food during a networking event this week, and Keith is a master class in what food should taste like. Oh my gosh! Uh, I I said I was gonna run away and marry his peach bruschetta this week. That was so good. Um, and then, uh, and then, you know, they have beer and alcohol and live music. Uh, I don't know if I sent it to you, but their emo night is coming back. It's a free event and it's like four emo bands. So yeah, I saw that. That's, gonna... that'll probably be my, my first evening event at, uh, at Oshkira. I'm yeah. excited though. The space there they have is, is just fantastic. It really is. It's a great spot. It's a great spot. It absolutely is. And speaking of great things, we have a lot of comics out this week, so we are going to talk through those. Um, there were so so many books returning this week and a bunch of new number ones, so we're going to kind of go through these as best as we can um, before the end of time. <laughs> Ironically, here is a book about time. Speaking of time, uh, yes, Forever Ford number two. Uh, this is from Scout Comics. And uh, this is that kind of, uh, like, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids fell into, I guess, a happy accident. Yeah. Uh, you essentially have your guy who is working on time travel. His friends show up, throw him a party, and they end up falling forward into time. Um, and now in this issue, I think it's 33 years ahead yeah. or 30 years ahead. Um, and so they have to basically just keep jumping forward mm -hmm. to wherever they're going. We don't quite know where that is yet, 
um, but where finally they stop in a futuristic time and get to see uh, supposedly not a lot survives except for apps. Yeah. Apparently, we can we can reestablish apps in the future. Like the world gets destroyed, but the first thing we reinvent is apps and like iPads. Yeah, you know. But it's cool because the apps teach kids. They have how to videos on how to rebuild society. Yeah. Which is, I mean, it's wonderful. I and adorable a, robots. Yes, adorable robots. That little robot was so cute. I was like, oh, I love this guy. Like, let's make him an ongoing character. And then that's not a thing that's going to happen. <laughs> uh, well, we don't know. We don't know. I we guess don't know. we don't. We don't know what this future has in store for these characters. But I've enjoyed it so far. I mean, Zach Kaplan tends to be one of those <laughs> writers that I, I like the storytelling uh, that he does. And I'm very interested to see where these characters are going to go. It's very, yeah, I like it because you do have this large group, so you know things are going to happen and, like, people are going to get picked off and different things are going to change. And I love that they're even self-aware of that. Yeah. Like, they're, like, he's like, oh, well, we know we make it back or we have to make it back. Like, we keep going forward. And we know we made it this far because there's a note on the wall because there's been a note in every time that they've gone to. And they're like, no, we know you make it this far and you might make it back but we don't really know if any of the rest of us do and i love that they establish that immediately like hey stop telling us everything's gonna be okay because you don't know anything and it's like we don't know anything you're right and so this has been really cool because every time you do get to a a different world it's like oh i kind of want to explore this and they're like this world sucks let's get out of here and it's like okay i guess we're not gonna explore cool And I'm excited, too, because I feel like this issue kind of is the beginning of the issues between the characters, Mm -hmm. you know, because up and up and that that whole first issue was like, oh, we have to time travel and that's going to be the big problem. But now we're starting to kind of see those, you know, walls break between the characters and eventually all the emotions are going to start setting in and. That's just going to add to to all the problems that are already <laughs> that they already have. So I I mean I'm really looking forward to where this takes us. What I loved about the first issue is it came out like the same week that Becoming Frankenstein came out for the first issue because you know Scout has that little delay between issue one and issue two. Mm-hmm. And reading this and reading Becoming Frankenstein and see, I I honestly this guy just immediately fell into that Frankenstein role of. I have to do this, I have to do this, I have to do this. And then it's like, oh, immediately, oh, shit, what did I create? Yeah. And yeah. I love that we get that because this time machine can't go both ways. It can only go forward. And it's like, oh, now I've got everybody stuck in the future and I don't know anything about how to fix this because I never finished my research on how to go back. Right. And so I love that you instantly get that. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. Jurassic Park moment. And um, I I love to see where this is going. And I'm not a big time time travel book person it's not always my favorite concept i think it's one of those like overplayed concepts but i like that this is like hey we're not actually traveling through time on purpose uh we just keep trying we just want to go home and it's kind of like almost wizard of oz like where you're just like i have to keep going to the next destination to figure right. out if this wizard can get me home kind of situation yeah it's a lot of fun and it's scout so it's good yeah so two issue number two forever forward you know, again, I, I feel like every time we talk about Scout, it's always positive. It's so. always positive, and we're going to do it a lot more on this show today. Um, up next, from Dark Horse, this is issue two of Castle Full of Blackbirds. This is another one of those uh, from the world of Hellboy, and honestly, this is the one that feels the most like it's from the world of Hellboy, because it, it you do actually see Hellboy at points in it, and the art looks like Mike drew it. It is yeah. not. It is not Mignola art, but it feel. It felt like it. I had to go back and check at some points because I was like, "Wait, that really looks like his art style on a lot of this." And um, but this is the story of Sarah, and it's her as a kid, and she is um, gone to this this school of wizard, which for witches and people with powers essentially, and um, they keep asking her if the BRPD knows she's there and if her family knows she's there. And she's like, no, and they're training her. And, of course, we know that the the headmistress has a secret plan. She's like, I have to train you special from everybody else. And um, Sarah gets gets to have this vision moment, and she sees all of this destruction and all of the bad things that are happening. And they ask her what she saw, and she said, I saw Hellboy. And he looked different, but it was Hellboy. And she kind of just leaves it at that. And they immediately are like, she's lying. 
And she knows that they're lying to her now, and they know she's lying to them, but neither one, like, has had that conversation. So it was a perfect issue to set up. Like, we finally know everything that's happening in the school and that there's all this stuff that's dark and coming for her and all this bad stuff is going to happen. But we also know that everybody's, like, a player in this game at this point, which is super cool. It definitely is going to be one of those perfectly, like, drawn-out stories to where you see all of the movement, and yet you're still like, oh, that was awesome when it happens. Yeah. I just have to read Hellboy, apparently. I I, I feel like it's gotten to a point, though, with Mignola, where he's like, I'm not writing Hellboy, but I need y'all to remember that that world exists. Yeah. Just in case I change my mind and decide to start writing Hellboy again. That just seems to be how it is. I also feel like he has a stable of artists that he has been training for many years to kind of almost emulate his art style. Because you see it quite often in a lot of the books that he's been writing. So the, the art looks eerily similar. And at times you're like, did he do the art for this? Am I crazy? Am I a crazy person? But yeah, I, I do think that uh, that's him just saying, I'm not ready to let go of Hellboy yet. And Mike, if you're listening, you know, sir, Mr. Mignola, uh, if you're listening, if you want a team of artists or an artist who's really ready to copy and emulate your style perfectly and beautifully, I hear Chris Sheehan is, you know, ready to go (laughs) at any time. So if you are looking for somebody who can do a great job of drawing similar in your style and would want to do an, an awesome respect to your style. I just, I'm just saying, Chris Sheehan is probably available. Also, if you want someone to write Lobster Johnson again. Phil is available. <laughs> I will write you all the Lobster Johnson stories that are up in my head right now. I need that character back. More than Hellboy. I would love to have Hellboy back, but bring back Lobster Johnson. Lobster Johnson. <laughs> uh, but yes, yeah, Castle Full of Blackbirds. Issue two. Still time to jump on. And it's one of those from the world of Hellboy, so it's probably going to be like four issues max. Yeah. Um, from Dark Horse as well. Shaolin Cowboy, Cruel to be Kin, issue six. Um, the lizards aren't telling the story anymore. I was a little little disappointed. Uh-huh. Um, I didn't see I didn't see Daddy Lizard and Baby Lizard or Giant Baby Head uh, monster at any point in time in this issue. But I did see some of the world's coolest art at the same time um if you haven't seen uh shaolin cowboy you i know you have been reading for a while uh, well i read the original run yeah um and this is technically i guess the volume two that first one was only four issues so i'm excited to see this one has kind of uh gone beyond that um but yeah i mean this is just like absurdity i feel like this is um, somebody who was influenced by like, Hunter S. Thompson in a weird way mm-hmm. in terms of how it's just kind of like weird, trippy storytelling of this guy running around just killing monsters and stuff. But uh, I haven't fully caught up on this one, but I mean, I'll easily back up how great these, <laughs> this art is. <laughs> it, it's just great. And like the first four or five issues – we were watching a dad was telling a baby lizard about the cowboy as he made his way into town. And this one's kind of like, okay, the cowboy's in town now and he's taking down this bad guy. So it, it doesn't need the narration. Like the action is happening. But that backstory with a lizard thinking like, this is my daddy because he saved me and telling us this story. It just added to the ridiculousness and the perfection of, of this story. But I opened up this issue and I was like, where are my lizards? I'm here for the lizards. Uh, I know it's 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 not about the lizards, but I'm I'm the team lizard all the way. <laughs> I mean, there's a you know there's a possibility that that they could come back. They could. They're on a rooftop, so they're like overlooking this whole thing. So they're there, I'm sure. Um, but don't let anything happen to the lizards, okay, guys? Yeah, and also do this forever, because I even remember when the first Shaolin Cowboy series came out, it wasn't very popular. And then it wasn't until later on people were like, oh, wow, this is actually really cool stuff. So I kind of hope we see this as an ongoing. Yeah, that would be uh, awesome. And kudos for, I mean, that much art and that detailed and getting it out monthly is such an incredible feat. Whenever I see somebody who does that detailed line work and the book stays on time, I'm like, how do you do that? (laughs) It's impressive. He also writes it. Mm -hmm. He pretty much does everything except for lettering, I think. I think so. Um, up next from Image, issue three of Deadliest Bouquet. Uh, 
I love this book. This is a fantastic story. And this is all about three women who are all named after flowers, who were all trained to be assassins by their mother, who was some kind of assassin. We still don't know. You get bits and pieces. Um, but it's kind of like a like a charmed or something like that, where it's like the three sisters have separated. And at the very beginning of issue one, one of the sisters finds the mother dead in the flower shop that they, they run together. And she, the police are called, but she also calls her sisters. And now the sisters are under investigation with the police, but they're also doing their own investigation. And so we're getting to see all of this stuff slowly unfold about who these women are and who the mom was. And every issue, you get a little bit more. But, you know, you've got the, the perfect golden child, the older one, who wanted out, so she got married and she had kids. And they don't know anything about this secret life that she lived with her mom where she was trained um, as this killer. And then you've got the middle sister who felt like it was her responsibility to stay home and help the mom. And, like, somebody had to do it. And, of course, like, it's her because she's, she's the middle sister and she gets stuck with everything. And then um, you have the youngest sister who's the party girl. And, like, literally in, like, issue two, she gets arrested because she goes to try to find information about the mom and just ends up in a bar fight. Um, And so you get, like, you have very, like, a meet, and that might even have been issue one. And so you get this immediate dynamic of who each girl is, and you see this great way that they interact together. And yet, like, none of them seem to really 100% trust the other anymore, but nobody also trusts anybody else. They trust each other way more than the outside so you get this like they're separately interviewed by the police but they all tell the same story and then they try to interview them all together to see if somebody will mess up and they're like finishing each other's sentences and so these are well-trained women at what they do and it's so cool to see this work and it's an entirely female creative team doing a story that's all female like badasses and so i i love this book for that it's like oh man i get like, just the strongest uh, female assassin book that you could possibly get. And, and a murder mystery all at the same time. And it's funny, and it's action-packed, and it's family-forward. So, it's super cool. Deadliest Bouquet. If you haven't started it, like I said, this is only issue three. And I'm pretty sure I still have copies in my Hurricane E and Destruction box of issues one and two. So, if you want to try it out, you can try them out for free. So, there you go. Um, speaking of scouts... Uh, earlier we said we're going to mention them a lot, and here we go. Agents of World, Issue 3, go for it, Phil. I know I know you love this book. So, I, this was the one I didn't get to. Mm-hmm. I haven't gotten to this issue yet, but essentially this is the story of Phil, who is an agent of World, and each issue is, it's not, I, I wouldn't call it an anthology, but each issue pretty much, or at least the first two issues, it's just different missions that he's gone on. Uh, one was fighting um, teenage robots. That was issue one. And then issue two was kind of an existential crisis mm-hmm. while battling some other kind of alien race or something. I don't remember what it was. Yeah, but, it was crazy. Or it could have been robots again. Um, but this is just one of those books where it's like really wonderful pencil work. You have each issue being a different kind of bit, uh, a different mission. And kind of uh, seeing a little bit more of uh, uh, Phil's world. Sorry, there's a lot of violence. There's a lot of violence. Nudity in this. Yeah, we've got in this one like the mo- like the creature type thing he's fighting is like a giant woman with giant boobs kind of thing, but she's naked the whole time. But she's I don't know if she's actually a human. I think she's like a, a creature. That's why I say that. Yeah, and so I, I mean. If you're here, if you want the, like, ridiculous kind of sci-fi mission adventure. Yeah, if you like Sweet Downfall, like, for the art style, you'll yeah, probably enjoy yeah. the art in this so much that you won't even care about the story. But you're getting that, like, like you said, like a sci-fi agency kind of story at the same time. Yes, and it may have you question... Reality. And everything everything you're doing while you while you do it <laughs> yeah i i usually read this and then i read a children's book afterwards i last <laughs> because i <laughs> i read this and i'm like sitting on the dock peering out thinking 
who am I? That's the last, especially that last issue. Who issue two, is we finished reading it, and you yeah, were like, shit. I don't know what I'm doing with my life anymore. And I was like, yeah, how would like, you? Do I have purpose? Right. What is my purpose? Who am I? Yeah. Like the Zoolander. Okay, yeah. <laughs> like, who am I? <laughs> like, I was like, uh, I feel like that's where I am after reading that issue, because it was so yeah. much of just the questioning yourself and reality and what you bring to this world and yeah. what this world brings to you that at, at the end of issue two, I was like, that was a lot. And you were like, yeah. yeah, yeah, it was. And I was like, I mean, I loved it. It was beautiful and amazing, but it was also done in that satirical kind of almost parody style writing where it was yeah. like, oh, you're kind of making fun of the spy world and you're kind of making fun of like the robots and all this. Like you name them like doofus and like things like that. And like they have ridiculous names, but at the same time, you somehow brought the deepest conversation. Like you brought your A game on yeah. psychology to the conversation. Yeah. I feel like it's like almost if like uh, Mark Russell took acid and then wrote a comic. <laughs> yeah. It'd be Asian of World. Yeah. <laughs> so that's a good way Can to describe it. Can we write that. that on the little. Right. I'm going to change little, the tag. The tag please. What if Mark Russell took acid uh, <laughs> and uh, you would, that's what you would, you would get. Um, up next from Dark Horse Comics is Parasomnia. This is issue three of volume two. If you didn't read volume one, I have it. You can uh, come purchase it from us because it's really cool. And honestly, this book is perfect if you are a fan of Dr. Sleep. Um, this is all about a young boy goes missing and his dad is determined to find him. And the only way he can ever get any clues or find any information is when he's asleep. And so he starts sleeping, and when he's sleeping, he ends up in this other world, and in the other world, he's fighting to find the, the Faceless Queen. And if he can find the Faceless Queen, he can defeat her and save his son. And so, of course, the first volume, we see that he's kind of, like, seen as a, like, he's kind of a homeless man living on a bench now, because he's given up everything to just sleep all day to try to find his son. He lost his wife, he lost his job, he, he looks like, you know, he's just an alcoholic, like curled up on a street corner but he's just trying to dream to save his son um and volume one kind of left us like just there um and i thought it was never going to come back i thought it got canceled or something and volume two comes back and it brings us new characters he's there's another player in the game and uh when you read it you're like oh snap like when you like figure out all the details of who it is um but in this particular issue the dad has suddenly Believes he's suddenly been kicked out of the dream world and can't get back in, but finds out that he might be in a different dream world and things are getting crazy. Uh, this has been an absolutely amazing book. And as you can see, you get that incredible Andrea Moody art. And it just, it lends so well to the story because you are blending like some one minute you're in a cyberpunk world and the next you're in like the 1800s and then you're suddenly in a hospital room. And I love this cave that he goes in. Tell me that's not Bunny Mask's cave. I was like, that cave looks like Bunny Mask's cave. <laughs> like I was like this man and he's just like, oh, and then like you're in a, suddenly you're in a tunnel in a cave. And I was like, that's totally looks like her cave. Um... Super cool, and my favorite thing is, honestly, if you flip back to the cover, every cover shows either the dream world on top or the real world on top, and then you flip it, and you get the opposite world. And the title, like, the trade dress is the same no matter what, which is such a cool way to do it. It feels very much like the upside-down kind of thing, where it's like, oh, no matter what world you're in, you're, you're, it's still there, and it's all one thing. And this book is really great. Um, I know we always give Cullen Bunn a lot of crap, um for like where he goes with his stories but so far like this one we haven't reached an ending so i don't know but so far we've been uh on a great adventure along the way and it does seem to just keep unfolding and giving the world a bigger thing so honestly colin bun just forget all the other books and uh stay with this one because it's fantastic this may have to be <laughs> one that i eventually start reading because i yeah. tend to avoid books with his name on it right. but I say that, but he did. Did he do a legacy of violence too? I think yes. He, so don't yeah, don't yeah. don't quit all books. Do that one too, because I really love that one <laughs> so far on issue one. Um, mm -hmm. It's great. You're gonna. There's gonna be two, and you're really you're reading Shock Shop, so we might push you up to three Colin Bun books. Sorry, it's gonna happen. Uh, That's the life I have to live. <laughs> from Scout Scout Comics, we have issue four of Code Forty Five. Go for it, Phil.
Yes, I don't want to give away Too this much. story. Because it's so good. So essentially, all I'm going to say is this is a character who uh, becomes a uh, train conductor. I guess that's what they're called. Conductors? Is that what they are? Subway operator? Yeah, subway operator. Mm -hmm. I forget what she is. She refers Not to herself as... Not the sandwich as... maker. What? Oh. <laughs> Those are artists. Those are always... Sorry, sandwich um, So this is a, a girl who ends up taking on uh, a job working the night shift as a subway operator. And there's some stuff that goes on in the tunnels of the subway. And it's referred to as a Code 45. And the first two issues was, hey, what's going on? What is this Code 45? There's obviously something behind the scenes that I don't know about. And in the last issue, issue three, we find out what that is exactly that's going on in the tunnels. Um, you kind of assume that's what it's going to be, mm -hmm. but you're not 100% sure. And then this issue just made me think I was wrong about everything. Yes. And well, yeah, it's yeah. It's like, oh, maybe it's not the thing I thought it was, but it's something yeah. similar to the thing. Or like it could be that, but then there's also another mm -hmm. little bit attached to it. Yeah. Things, um, things get weird. But essentially this issue is the main character now that she knows kind of an idea of what's going on. Uh, this issue, she decides to abandon everything else in life and just spends the entire issue um, trying to get to the bottom of of this. And, you know, it causes problems. You know, her and the boss are kind of having a little... I'm going to skip that. that page. Okay. Um, her and the boss have a little tip. She gets suspended. You know how it goes. She gets suspended, but that's usually when it, it hits the fan. Yeah, you know how it goes. When you stop doing your job and you go on an investigation to figure out whether or not something crazy is going on in the subway tunnel, you get suspended. Does it take place in Chicago? No, it's in the <laughs> London. London. That was the Chicago map. Um, it's also apparently the tubes of London. Um, but I love it. I love anything that has like when they actually show like the researching maps that they have and puts it in there. I think it's super cool. Must stop there. Right. Everything else. Because I think like. this, this is one of those that I, it's not at the top of my reading pile, but I'm still really excited when I get to it. Like it's usually, it's not one of the first like few books I'm really like hyped to read. But then when I get to it, I'm like, yes. I always put it good. in, like, right after. I always put my number ones, and then I usually put this, like, somewhere right underneath that. Mm -hmm. Where it's like, okay, just in case all of those number ones sucked, I know that Code 45 <laughs> is going to bring me back up. And so I always put it, like, next to some of the, like, newer or heavier books that I don't know how I feel about them yet. I put Code 45 in there because I know it's going to be fun. It's yeah. solidly yeah. fun every time. And I just... Like, I love that they're stringing us along on what is actually going on. And I'm like, I can't wait to find out. But also don't tell me. Just keep stringing me along because I love it. Yeah. Yeah. Also, I'd really like to see this as a show. Yeah. Like, you know, if you want to talk about comic book adaptations, mm -hmm. I think that would be one that you could do very easily. Because you can center around the, the drama just between the people themselves yeah. um, and stretch that out forever. So, yeah, yeah. I would like to see that. Adapted yeah. at some point. Can we have some wine? Oh my gosh, everyone, yeah. Everybody is out of wine. Oh, it looks past So why don't y'all, I was say, I can go first because I, I have comics and stuff to. Yeah, it's like 14%. Oh, really? Yeah. What's the average percentage of alcohol content? In wine? In wine. 12. Yeah. 12.9. Okay. Does that 1.1% make a big difference? Bro, I just made that number up. I don't know oh. if that's even true. <laughs> I, uh, I was, Thanks for trusting me. I was taking I think it's you like seriously. Eight or nine percent. Is it? Yeah, Zach probably like has done his research. I totally just made numbers up. It's okay. We have another bottle. Um, uh, speaking of do you books, want... do you, yeah, because he's he hasn't touched, touched it. it. No, you did. Okay, he's no, not gonna you touch got, it. You got the weakest. Try it? I don't want to try it. You should try it. It's different. Yeah, I need a break from alcohol. Right, okay, he's on a break. He's on a break. So a drink break. it. Cool. Drink it for him. I, I learned the the horrible decision making of daiquiris <laughs> and how delicious they are. They're so good. And how unprepared I was yeah, for I the sugar content. <laughs> right, Zach's like no. Yeah. Um. Up next, um, Scout Comics again, issue two, as of the barbed. 
Um, this is another one of those books that I think we said issue one, like, I can't remember if we actually put it in the picks of the week or if it was just like on that, like, it was close. It should have been a pick of the week. Um, preface to before we go into issue two, they, if you ordered issue one, they sent you new copies of issue one because issue one was printed without half of the text in it. And which is weird because I think we we love that it didn't have text on all those pages. Um, and it totally worked. And then now that I've read it with the text, I'm like, oh man, that just made the story so much deeper and so much better. Can I be honest though? You really liked it without the text. I still like it without the text. It was because it felt like Sailor Moon transformations, and I kind of got to tell my own story. But I feel like I got two issues because it didn't feel like re like the first part felt like rereading issue one, Mm -hmm. and then because the second half didn't have the text last time, it felt like I was was getting an issue like 1.5 because like yeah. I still remember what I felt when I read it without all that text so it felt like this is like issue 1.5 uh, or the last one was the new text was issue 1.5 and now I got issue two and yeah. um I still love it I still love this book it's yeah. it's so good um this is a story of of two sisters specifically we follow as a who is the older sister, and in this town, um, or this kingdom, I should say, they get marked when they come of age to a certain point, like at least the royal family does. And you're supposed to get these beautiful, amazing marks that show that you're a member of the special order of these people who protect the world. And um, Aza gets her marks and their barbed wire instead of the beautiful floral marks that everybody gets. And that all happened pre the book ever starting uh, because the book picks up at issue one picked up with as his little sister getting her marks and everybody is like, Oh, you're going to be perfect. You're going to be wonderful. And uh, it's, you're not going to be like your older sister. You're going to get good marks. And as it shows up, she's kind of an outcast, but she shows up to support her sister. And um, issue one kind of left with her presumably returning home and finding out that her charge of what she's been protecting has been destroyed. And now in issue two, um, we have the, the case of body snatching going yes. on and, uh, possibly a demon possessing as a, and is it because of her marks or is it because of something else who knows, but it has now, uh, created a world where sister is versus sister. Um, but yeah. not actually because as a, in the spirit world that she's trapped in is still trying to figure out how to get back and help her sister. Yeah. And it's. It's kind of cool because I feel like we're going to get these two stories side by side. You'll have one of the sister um, kind of battling her possessed sister, uh, uh, battling the possessed Aza. And then on the other side, we kind of have Aza in the spectral realm. Kind of, uh, you know, they give you the whole like, oh, do you want to know why you have the curse of the barbs? Mm -hmm. And so, of course, you're like, well, yeah, like, let's keep this going. And as long as this cool wolf is going to be her guide, like... Hey, the wolf is super I'm all, Yeah, I'm totally on board. Um, but, yeah, and I, I love the colors. Love the uh, colors. For this dream world. So, I mean, you can keep me with that alone, but then you also have this really wonderful story. Uh, I'm excited to explore the relationship between the sisters. I feel like we barely just scratched the surface. Mm-hmm. I love they kind of have, like, um, a fun little joke. And this one between the two of them. Um, Which really built that sister relationship. It's like everybody else may be against Azza, but her sister still is like, that's my big sister. I love her. I want to have fun with her. And um, I want to protect her. Even she's like, I don't care what everybody else says. Azza has to be here for me. Um, And then immediately is like, you know, what's going on with my sister? And I love that. I love that sister to sister dynamic that they're playing into in this book. Um, Pat Shan. The writer of this, they are also the writer of Destiny New York. So I was saying I don't know why oh, Destiny New York's been on a delay for a minute. Now I wonder if this is why. Uh, because we are getting this amazing As of the Barb story. And you know what? Two stories I absolutely love. Um, I want to see more of both. Just, you know, you said, I know Pat, they said they had like 40 issues of Destiny New York created before it ever got put into print. So if you just want to make As a like a 40 issue thing as well, like let's just keep going. Let's just do what we can. I mean, it's it's doable. You kind of hit the gas right off the bat, you know. Yeah. But, I mean, you can maybe slow it down a little bit because mm-hmm. I feel like we're, like, fully, We're flying, but, like, I don't know where it's going. Like, so. we're only two issues in, and I feel like this book's been out, like, five or six issues. Yeah. Um, it's It's been wonderful, but, yeah, as of the Barbarian, or the Barbed, number two, Um, you know, Scout. 
Yeah. How, how many times can we say it? How many times can we say we love Scout? Scout. Uh, <laughs> you're like Scout. Scout. <laughs> <laughs> uh, from Mad Cave, we've got issue four of Tiger's The Tiger's Tongue, uh, which has been one of my ongoing favorite books that nobody else is picking up yet that needs to be picked up. Um, I don't think enough people are reading this, and I can't put it in your hands enough and tell you how great it is because it's so wonderful. Um, this is very similar to Azza, which is why I wanted to put it like near it. This is another one of those stories where it's two sisters that are put against each other. And much like the as a story, we see two sisters who initially are, I'm on the same side as you. And what happens in this world is they're each descendant that takes the throne has the power of the tiger. And in this world, as long as it's one descendant, like one sibling is born, they get the power, they take the throne. But in this particular instance, these two sisters are born as twins. And there is a rule that if twins are born, the power be will be split between them until they battle to the death and one will gain the power on the day of like the coronation. And they've all known this forever, except for the twins. The dad, who's the king, has kept this from them. And then on the day where they go in for the coronation, the dad's like, oh, by the way, before we crown your sister queen, just want you to know, that's actually not the case. You have to battle to the death through all of these trials now, and one of you will gain all of the power and the crown, and the other will be dead. And they just are like, uh, we don't want to do that. And initially it's like, okay, we don't, we're not going to fight each other. We're not going to do this. And it's like, okay, well, we have to. So they start to do it. And over the course of time, we've seen the sister who wasn't initially destined for the crown has slowly kind of gone into that like mad queen kind of power. And she's kind of starting to fall apart. And we're seeing this battle, like we're seeing them kind of shift roles where the one 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 sister who was like, you know, do whatever you have to do to gain power is like, you can't do that. Like, you're you haven't trained, you haven't loved our people. Like, our people matter, and we we're trying to change this, and you're becoming this mad queen that everybody else has, and you don't even have this power yet. And in this particular issue, they're on the final challenge, and the one sister is like, you're right, I've gone crazy. I won't fight you. I'll just back down. And they show up for the trials, and she's like, my sister wanted me to back down. I get why she said that. I'm here to tell you I'm not going to do it. And they go into, they have to go into the, like, battle of the death now. Um, it's crazy. It's been wonderful. Um, it feels like you're reading this beautiful folktale, like, that's been around for thousands of years that's come into a new existence through this comic book because it just has such an amazing world that they didn't even have to really do the world building for you to automatically feel connected to the world that they built, like, they show something in the kingdom and you're like, you didn't even tell me what that is, but I feel like I already know what it is when you jump into it. Um, great story. I think this falls into that mad cave resurgence that we're seeing um, with Speed Republic and things that are coming out. Um, Legacy of Violence. I think we're just seeing this big mad cave like uptick right now. And you're going to be talking about mad cave a lot in the future. And this is going to be one of those titles that people are going to be like, how did I miss that? And they're going to want to go back for it. Grab it now. Tiger's Tongue, issue four. I have all four issues. I recommend it highly. Um, That's in stock because we've talked about it enough. Um, Sacrament, issue three of five from AWA Upshot. This is a fantastic book. Um, uh, this is one of those Peter Milligan just kind of flexing on writing for a minute. Um, this is the story of... A futuristic society we've all moved out into space and where it's like oh we moved away from the demons of earth but we realize that we are literally the demons of earth and also guess we actually still have to deal with literal demons uh, and this is a priest who's kind of fallen off on his faith but he still illegally performs all the sacraments and everything um, and he gets caught delivering uh, communion on a planet and they bring him in and they're like, we actually only brought you in because somebody has, this person has been possessed by the devil and we need you to figure it out. And he's like, I don't really believe in possession or the devil or God. Like, I'm just, I feel like I'm stuck doing this because I've been doing it for so long and I don't want to let down my assistant, you know, my nun who's been working with me. And uh, now we're getting this possession like exorcism and like exorcist in space kind of story so it's like hey in space nobody can hear you scream kind of thing but also there's nowhere for you to go and demons are there now and he uh in this issue is like i'm not gonna do it there's nothing we can do about it 
uh, over the last couple issues. And now in this issue, it's like, even he's like, okay, maybe demons are a thing. Uh, this, like, you know, it's hitting the fan. And, and uh, I don't know how to get around this. So I guess I have to figure out how to do an exorcism. And he did one a long time ago. And he feels like, you know, as with all exorcist stories, they did the one. And, like, the person didn't make it. So they feel like it's on them and they can never do another one. He has that backstory. And now he's... Uh, He's got to he's got to step up and do this exorcism or he and everybody else is going to die. Is there some boobs in there? Yeah. All right. I'll stop there. Yeah. This is one that I remember when the first the cover for issue one came out. And I was like, that's such a badass cover. And I never got around to reading it. I think the first issue came out. You were gone. Yeah. We did the live stream, and you, I think you commented on the live stream, that looks dope, I can't wait to read it. And then issue yeah. one and two came out before you got a chance. I'll and have to pick this one up. You gotta catch up. It's so good. We have all three issues, and it's AWA, so it's fantastic. It'll be the nine ninety nine trade, too. It'll be a nine ninety nine trade when it comes out, so if you don't catch it before the issue's in. It is a five part, so you've got two more months before it ends, um, and then it'll probably be another month. So you're looking at like January, February before you get a trade, but that trade will be 10 bucks. Or you can come in now and grab the individual issues because we do have issues one, two, and three on the shelf. Um, and I highly recommend uh, it for a great like spooky time start because um, it is, it's creepy. If you're like into any of those exorcism movies, uh, this is exorcisms in space i i do have a quick question though uh are you pro or against jason x that was the one in space right <laughs> the 15th in space yeah yeah <laughs> okay oh that's a what was that both of y'all saying pro jason oh, no. x i am matt oh, okay. of course matt is I do, okay it's silly <laughs> it's silly but yeah it's a great comedy yeah Right, Zach, you saw it, so it's obviously not a horror film. Yeah, no, it's not. It's more <laughs> like a sci-fi film that has Jason in it for like 10 minutes. Dude, that guy never does anything in his no, movies. He doesn't. He's the worst serial killer of all time. He's got mother issues. He does. Yeah. So did Norman Bates, but at least, you know, he did. Yeah, something. but I mean, Norman Bates isn't going out killing multiple sure. people. No, but he looks good while he lives in his hotel. Just that's, saying. Anthony, that's fair. Anthony Perkins is a be- was a beautiful man. Uh, Phantasmagorium, Phantasmagoria from Black Caravan, which is the horror imprint of Scout. Speaking of possessions, yes. this is issue two. Uh, do you want This issue one was our pick of the week uh, by far when it came out. Uh, what do you think about issue two? Was it a pick of the week? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was, I said it was my pick of the week before I was even finished with it on, I was reading it on the exercise bike and Matt came up and was like, hey, can you come help me with something? And I was like, hang on, I'm reading my pick of the week right now. <laughs> and like, I like, knew just from opening the book and looking at it, I was like, this is going to be my pick. And I was not wrong. Uh, yeah, this is the story of, uh, of uh, in the first issue, you have uh, a murder that takes place. Uh, in the streets of London, I believe. That in the London. Victorian time period. Yeah, in the Victorian time period. Um, and it is a grisly murder. And, of course, we have our uh, Sherlock Holmes-esque detective, but he dapples in, in the black magic and the, the mystical arts. Very from hell. Like, Alan yes. from hell. Yes, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and so in that issue, uh, 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 in that first issue, a second family is murdered and now we kind of have the follow up to that. Yeah. Um, everyone's trying to figure out what's going on. Yeah. Uh, We learned exorcisms don't always work. And after the first issue, uh, I assume they never work. (laughs) That's fair. Unless it's John Constantine doing it. I, tr- I trust that guy to do exorcisms. That guy shows up drunk and smoking cigarettes and feels like this is going to work. <laughs> if the guy coming in, to, or lady, coming in to do an exorcism is doesn't have a cigarette in their mouth, I'm out. <laughs> I'm leaving. I have right. no faith. No faith after that. And you that. accomplishing your goal. Do uh, they have to have like a really thick like Cockney accent and like swear I, at you? Well, I mean, in... In reality, I kind of already do believe that I should trust all British people. That's fair. Um, Including Nigel. 
Well, he doesn't have the accent. <laughs> If That's they come it. in with the accent, I'm immediately like, okay, you're smarter than I am. <laughs> you have a better grip of reality. And I should just trust you. There you go. British um, people, if you're watching it, Phil's going to be a <laughs> sucker for anything you try to sell him or tell him. Uh, look, it doesn't, it doesn't take much to wow me. But you throw that accent on it, you know, like like Robert Pattinson in all his interviews. I'm just like, you've, you've grown even more in my heart <laughs> because of your accent. Oh, alone. spunk ransom. I love uh, that so yeah, this is uh, this is kind of a, a murder mystery, but with those dark arts. Yeah, with the dark arts, there's a bad guy running around doing bad guy stuff. I mean, look, I I do really enjoy this book. And we got a new group of characters this this year. We yes. we saw some, you know, we found some new mediums, some new people who can communicate with the dead, um, some more people who can do magic. And who could potentially stop this or make it worse? We're we're trying to see it. And the thing is, is that because our our main detective is he's a paranormal detective, but the cops don't respect that. So of course he's always in trouble with the law. They just assume he's the killer because you know there's no such thing as paranormal right. instances in their mind. But I love this art. They always the way they show. Yeah the like the possession through these black and white things or even just like the spirits of the dead world mm -hmm. it just it's so cool and the layers that they're able to add through this pencil work um and this inking really the inking the inking is the is the master class here and i guess joe bocardo did all of that yeah uh, and the inking mm. is extraordinary on this book i love i would love to see the original pages yes most definitely like uh but this is definitely a tour de force mm -hmm. in art and it does pair well with the story like it brings me even more into this and then you just have like a cast of characters that you're like you're already on board with yeah. all these characters um they all have some like even his little ward yeah. the little kid that goes I love around that kid. uh he's like fearless and you know i love that he's just like no the guy's like no you wait I'll go and investigate. He's like, no, we're like, we're like you know, this. Yeah. We gotta go in together. I He's gotta like go with you. He's like little British short round. Yeah. Like, no, Dr. Jones, I go with you. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I go with you. Yeah. He's like. Essentially. Yeah. Essentially. He reminds, it would be like if short round had been played by the actor who always looks like he's 12, the one that was um, on Game of Thrones and was in Love Actually. And, um, oh, and, exactly uh, who you're yes, about. and was in Maze Runner. And he always looks like he's a twelve year old and I can never remember who he is. Are you looking it up, Zach? Yes, Thank I you. Am. Yeah, he he's <laughs> always he never he looks like he has not aged a day. And I think he would have been great for playing this kid. Um one hundred percent. Thomas Brody Sangster. Thomas Brody Sangster, yes. Uh, Which is not a name you would think. Oh yes, of course. <laughs> oh yes. Uh, but Phantasmagoria Black Caravan issue two, uh grab this. Also just grab anything that has a black caravan uh yeah. label on it. Um yeah. Joseph Maki has definitely proven that he knows how to handle an imprint. He yes, this 100%. is this is an amazing like he's killing it Good as a, as a editor in chief of Black Caravan. Uh, it's like when they it's sometimes it's so funny because you hear people who are like oh they're gonna have a, this person's imprint and you're like well we'll see what they do and like Joseph Smocky was like the horror equivalent of Rick Riordan being given an imprint at Disney like Rick Riordan was like okay well now I have like all of these books from all these people and I feel like Joseph Smocky did the same thing where he just like was like I immediately have all of the best people working on my stuff here yeah. we are he, I mean he definitely surrounded himself with a lot of really wonderful people. A lot of talented people. Yeah. Um, from IDW and their originals imprint, we have issue three of True Cult. Uh, don't look at the book. You'll never know what that actually says. It says True Cult. Um, this is, honestly, Julie, if you mixed, like, Chicken Devil with one of these horror books we just time talked about, this is this is what you would get. Um, this is the story of a of the gentleman who works at a fast food restaurant and he's kind of over it, but also not at the same time. Like this is a man who loves his job. He has the menu memorized, he talks menu, he thinks menu, he's all in all the time. He never actually like he's not a manager, he's just been there for like thirty years and like doesn't want to ever do anything else. But kind of needs some money, so he ends up doing a robbery, and uh, somebody catches 
knows that he does that and um they bring him in to murder some people and do a a crime for them and they just happen to be the satanic cult and it's somebody in the cult wants to take out the people in charge of the cult so that they can take over and do stuff and they hire him and and by hire him i mean they kidnap him and they threaten his life and they tell him if he doesn't do it he's gonna die um and he is like hey if i do do it i'm also going to die but what's great is when they kidnapped him, they did it when he is talking to a person who he's just hired. And this is a girl who came in for her interview and knew everything about the menu. She's like, oh, I worked at this other location a long time ago. But I'm, like, uh, obsessed with our stuff. And, like, everything, like, there's a scene in this particular issue where they finally, like, get thrown into the cult and they have to go through all the like levels to get to level 66 underground where the satanic cult leader is supposedly at um and they walk by a menu like or uh, by, walk by a menu they walk by a door and they're she's like do you smell that and he's like yeah and she's like smells like there's at least 26 of this burger combo from our restaurant like in that room and like she he's like says like no i think it's 25 and she's like definitely 26 and it's like so cute because they're both like super obsessed with this restaurant and they're told in this issue they have to go undercover and pretend to be a couple who wants to join this cult. And she's like, hi, I know you're going to kill us if we don't do what we want, and like what you want, and we have to do this murder. But I haven't technically started, so this is kind of like my first day, and he's going to be my su supervisor. And I feel like HR might have a problem with me pretending to be his significant other, and I just want to make sure there's not going to be any complications with my job in the future if I take on this thing. And then we find out a lot more about this girl. She's my favorite character because she literally spells out, like, all this, like, burger facts and all these fast food things. And then, like, suddenly has action hero skills. And he's like, what is going on? And she's like, I'm a layered person. You'll figure <laughs> it out. And, like, she just goes back to what she's doing. And you're like, what is happening? And at the same time, his best friend, who is the manager, is on a quest to find him. And so she's having to, like, figure out who might have kidnapped him and where they're going. And so that's why I'm like, it's kind of like Chicken Devil, but if it... Okay. And Vinyl. That's what it is. It's Chicken okay. Devil and Vinyl mixed together. It's, that's all you need. You need a book that's Chicken Devil and Vinyl mixed together in your life. I 100% promise you, you need both of those books in your life. And now you need to add True Cult to that mix because it's a great blend of those two things. I mean, you you said all the things that I like. To I know. So. That's what I was going for. I was just trying to sell you, Phil. I don't care if the people at home read it. I just need you to read it because I know you'll love it. Um, uh, <laughs> Nigel said, when you said the actor who always looks like they're 12, I thought you were talking about Gary Coleman. <laughs> no, Nigel. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's talking about an actor who actually... <laughs> <You're> Nigel. <fine. laughs> I miss you, buddy. <laughs> we, um, IDW's original imprint also brings us crush. I'm sorry, pause for a second. Zach just tried his very first zebra cake in his entire life and you missed the face that that man made. I, this is the greatest I, moment. It was it was beautiful. I'm so glad I, I got to see had like an orgasm. <laughs> It's a uh, it's a delicacy. Yeah, that zebra cake. A lot of people ignore because it's a little Debbie snack. Right, little Debbie. We will never ignore you and your zebra cakes. We love them. Phil is keeping Matt in supply of zebra cakes because Matt said it's one of his favorite things, but he won't buy them because he because it's, it's a luxury. Because it's a luxury, which is totally true when you don't take a paycheck. Um, uh, but so Phil has been blessing our lives with zebra cakes and zach had never tried one in his entire life and uh i Why am so I? so glad you got to see this experience also little debbie if you want to sponsor pat city comic professionals holy shit please. we're here we will please. talk about you we can call this wind down your weekend with little debbie we don't care holy shit. we're here for you because i also i also love like the the oatmeal cream pies like well okay so my issue with oatmeal cream pies is they no here but this is, here's the thing. They have now done it to where it's a double, it's basically like a double stuffed version. Whoa. It's too much cream. It's too much cream? It's too Whoa, much of the Debbie, cream. Debbie, calm down. No, it's no, like, calm down. The cream is great. <laughs> I like the cream, but there has to be that correct ratio. I need to get more of so I need, 
I need yes. I need more cookie. Comment your favorite Little Debbie snack cake and whether or not uh, I mean you, you know what your favorite one is. Like there's so many Little Debbie cosmic Debbie brownies, cosmic the nutty cookies. butter. Thing. Does she do the star crunch? Yeah. Yes. Star, Star Crunch, Crunch was my obsession yeah. as a Star child. Crunch. I was obsessed. Back when I still could eat chocolate, mm-hmm. uh, I ate, because I'm a huge it's caramel fan. And so as a kid, when I could force my, like I was still drinking, having caffeine and I could have it, I ate so many Star Crunches. I feel like I single-handedly kept Little Debbie in business. Uh, my grandma owned a, well, I don't know, my grandma did because my grandma owned a, a grocery store. And so I would make oh, her okay. order Star Crunches and then I would just eat them all. Um, up next from yeah, IDW Originals, that was on me, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> on ID, from IDW Originals, we have issue two of Crashing. Phil, tell them what it's about. Yes, so this is a, basically, this is your uh, hospital drama set in a world uh, where we have superheroes. Uh, there are superpowered humans uh, roaming around. Uh, but this follows uh, one doctor who is works in the ER and may have um, a substance abuse addiction. She does have a substance abuse That is also plays into this heavily. And in the first issue, we get a little bit of everything. We get to see kind of her struggle with um, her typical, you know, rounds. We all know that people who work in the ER have these like crazy long hours. Uh, a lot of sleeping at the hospital. Mm-hmm. Um, Issue one felt very Grey's Anatomy. Yeah, very Grey's Anatomy. Nice. And but you also find out that there's like a political aspect to this story because you know very much like Civil War, they're trying mm-hmm. to um, put laws on superpowered people, which would force them to register and kind of abide by the rules of uh, the government. And uh, we also, at the end of issue one, um, find out that uh, this main character may also be uh, doing off-site yes. uh, work as well. And that kind of takes the, the forefront of this issue. Um, we kind of see her dealing with her addiction, with her marriage, and um, with uh, this kind of side not, I wouldn't necessarily say as a side hustle. I don't want to get too deep into it, but um, yeah, essentially you're getting this, um, all of these kind of things going on at the same time. So, I mean, I've enjoyed this book yeah. so far. I was a little uncertain at first because um, I know not too long ago we had another ER story. Was it e- E-T-E-R? Yeah, E-T-E-R. And then we also had... A different one on top of that. There was yeah. a lot of like hospital drama, kind of like in, in sci-fi hospital books going on. Yeah. Um, and you and I talked about this last time. Was we were like, oh man, another like superhero adjacent book. And then you, you, and then we talked about it. And then you said it on the live stream, and I was like, wait, this was the one we were talking about. I totally forgot there were superheroes in this book. Yeah. Um, it really is just very driven by this substance abuse yeah. and this medical drama. And the political drama. And I love the way this works because she does not agree with her partner who is running for political office and is in charge of, like, is pushing for this registration law. And she doesn't agree with it. And so it's such an interesting dynamic to see their conversations where he's like, oh, we have to, well, we're I'm going to be doing this, this, this tomorrow. And she's like, okay. And he's like, I know you don't agree with any of it, but here's what we're doing. This is what's happening. And he still wants to tell her about his life, but she doesn't agree politically with any of it. So it's such an interesting family dynamic. And then behind his back, she's doing all this work for all these superpowered people and she's fighting for them. And so it's so interesting to see like a person who's out there fighting for them and a person fighting against them politically versus physically. And then their worlds intersecting. It's kind of just a really cool dynamic for a story. Um, I'm always surprised by how much, like after two issues, I'm, I'm hundred percent sold on this book, Yeah. but I, I definitely had one of those where I was like, Oh, yeah, it's superheroes. And then I was like, oh, my God, I don't care. It falls in that radiant black category for me where it's like, oh, we're going to talk about the way people feel and the way people think and not just their superpowers, which volumes one and three of radiant black really did. Um, This even more so goes into the humans in that world and not the superpowered people. So it's even more so just about the emotions and the, the story. And honestly, like 
for Grey's Anatomy fans, this is going to be your break into comics if you're not already in there. This is a great one. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. I think this is worth checking out. Only two issues in. Mm -hmm. I gotta say, IDW Originals. I'm in. They're they're doing some interesting stuff. Yeah. Because they also have that uh, Columbus killing Columbus. Book. Yeah, Earth Divers. They also have uh, uh, the Earth Wildfires, Divers. the Dark Spaces is. Wildfires, which is a continual pick of the week for me. Um, there, I mean, you started. You were like, "Hey, we want to have an IDW original imprint. Let's call Scott Snyder yeah. and and Hayden Sherman and launch with that." And you know, good job. Good job. And you followed it up with incredible, incredible books uh, after that. Um, I love the comments coming in about the Little Debbie's. Uh, Nigel said, Oatmeal Cream Pie, hands down, favorite Little Debbie snacks. Yep, but try the new one. Right, do you Nigel, like it the with double. the double stuff? It, and it's, it's a whole different dynamic. And then Ram said, Chocolate Chip Cookie Cream Stop. Pies. Chocolate chip cookie cream pies. I don't. Cosmic I, brownies. Okay, I oh, don't. I don't. More. I don't want to come too much into the realm of being a fat guy, but I think the chocolate chip cream pies were Hostess. Oh, okay. Oh. Well, he said that and, and cosmic brownies, uh, cosmic and brownies Star and Crunch and Nutter Butter bar, Nutty Buddy bars. I love uh, the are his butter favorite bars, little yeah. Debbie snacks. Ram, yeah. I love that there was a list. I love that you came with all of them. I mean, because I'm like, I can't pick one. Those are the only little Debbies I've tried is the Nutter Butter. Uh, they got a lot of really good ones. I mean, I you can go stand at, at Walmart, and they have a whole Little Debbie's rack. And now they have the ice set. cream. Yeah, which is not... Don't try it. Okay. It's a disappointment. All right. I tried the zebra cake ice cream, and uh, it doesn't taste like zebra cake at all. And can I borrow the bottle for a second afterwards to talk about it? Yes, because Thank it you. is one of the most beautiful labels. Oh, yes, I know. We have to talk about it. And it goes with some of the books we have on there. I would can... never hire you to pull wine <laughs> Why? Good God. That was messy. He made a big mess over it's, there. No, it's the the size of the pour. You think alone. it was too heavy Well, to he bought it so he can spin. He can pour. Uh, yeah, uh, first of all. He can he can a pour as pour much is as never you a bad pour. <laughs> and when you already paid for the bottle, pour away. <laughs> Ooh, Rams is filled. Look it up on the little dead. Oh, you're getting called out. All right. All right. He, just made his he did his research. Uh, I don't have internet in this building, so I, I oh, didn't. I'm gonna get that fixed for you. I, I can didn't. Work on that. I didn't try the. Uh, I didn't look it up before I I opened my mouth. But... Check your facts, Phil. Oh, my man. bad. We're getting called out. Okay, well, I got a second wine. We opened a second bottle of wine. This is Scarlet Vines, and Zach picked it solely for the label, which goes with some of our books. Actually, a lot of books recently have had this, like, art where these, like, people are turning into trees, and so um, I love this, but this is a, the story of Scarlet Vine has long been told by those who admire and fear her. Her bold independence and seductive strength are legendary. Her beauty grows as she ages. Scarlet Vine was born in a lush century-old mountain vineyard. Locals swear that the vines produce perfect fruit so intense in flavor and colorful that the vines appear at a sea of scarlet, as a sea of scarlet red. Anyone who tastes the wines crafted from this fruit is destined to fall under her spell. Do you dare? Uh, this is a cab sab. It's from the Hillside Vineyard, uh, selected Hillside Vineyards. It's probably it's I'm assuming a California wine. Most cab sabs are no wine of Chile. It's from Chile, so uh, and then imported to California. So you know maybe the grapes are Chilean. It has a gold flex in that label too. Oh dang! Somehow made it to, to Florida. Somehow it's made Chile, it to Florida. California. To- Florida. I'm here for it. I'm There's ready to try it. I'm going to give it to you. Why there. don't let me have things? Um, <laughs> really excited to try it. I have not. I'm going to take a drink really fast. Oh, that's different. Yeah. I like it, but it's it's definitely different. I didn't... Mm. I, when we first tried it, Matt and I, I was like, Matt, smell it. And he was like, plums. And I said, hey. Like, it smells like... It does... Earthy. Yeah. Yeah. It smells it's like... It's very oh. earthy. It's... Ma- which, of course, Matt sold on. It smells like the earth. Smell that. I don't care if you smell my wine. That smells like earth. Doesn't it smells it smell like, like peat. Hay? It smells like peat. It smells peat. like every other wine I smell. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> it smells no different. No. From that that smells like completely wine? different. That yeah. is, it actually doesn't <laughs> smell like wine. That's why I was bringing it up. I'm going to move this because I will talk about that for seven years. Um, We're going to talk about... Uh, Issue two of Bone Orchard Mythos. This is 10,000 Black Feathers, and this is uh, Wednesday Phil's favorite creative team ever working together. Yes. Uh, I was thrilled. I mean, Gideon Falls is one of those series that I love start to finish. 
Um, so when I found out that Jeff Lemire and Andrea Sorrentino were going to have their own um, kind of universe to build, uh, I was very excited. The first thing they put out was uh, a hardcover. They put out a, a the one-shot hardcover. The free comic hard... day was first. The oh, yeah, pat- yeah, that's right. And that's then right. the passageway. And then the passageway, and now we have 10,000 Black Feathers. And this is kind of, uh, we're going to see two timelines going at the same time. Uh, and you have these two friends who um, they become friends in like middle school Mm -hmm. and uh, they just one of the girls is uh, kind of creating her own literary universe and in their friendship they start working on this universe together they kind of start working out and fleshing out everything that's going on Um, and so you kind of get especially in this issue you get the two of them kind of like playing out these like kind of D&D style quests um but also we flash back to or not flash back we flash forward I guess to the present day um where one of the two girls is is now missing Mm -hmm. and uh the other girl who has returned to kind of maybe figure out what's going on um but I gotta say in these first two issues this is the most tame Andrea Sorrentino's paneling has been. Absolutely. And it's still really dynamic, but yet still the most... Like, there's no circular motion or anything. Um, I can't wait, because I know that that means there's a reason for it. Yeah. And he's going to open up in a second uh, when we get to... Like, because, I mean, that's already... This is tame for Sorrentino, but he's going to open up, I feel like, in issue three, because we just kind of got to this, like, oh, this is possibly what's happening, and I think as that starts to unfold, we're going to see more and more of his eccentric paneling that he does that really, really yeah. changes things. And uh, this it's an extraordinary book. Uh, 10,000 Black Feathers, Jeff Lemire is just, he's such a great horror writer. Um, but he's, I think one of the things Jeff Lemire does the best is writes relationships. Yeah. And putting this relationship between these two girls in there has just been extraordinary because you've got these, you've, because one of them is missing. And so you've got that, like, oh, my friend is missing. I have to do this. And you have all the guilt and everything. But then you go back and you see their friendship and you see those moments of throughout time where somebody's like, oh, we're the best friends and now we're falling apart. And now we're best friends and now we're falling apart. And you see that cyclical nature of friendship over those first two issues. And then now it's like, oh, now you're missing. And now I'm now I'm falling apart. Mm-hmm. And it's such a it's such a cool dynamic. And I mean, coming out of May's book and into and, and into this, going back, like this feels like if you took May's book and Gideon Falls and mashed them up, this is what you're gonna get. And uh it's so it's so freaking good. Oh my gosh, yes, yeah, Match is held up primordial. Let's that's Well so- he, he also did Little Monsters. Mm-hmm. Little Monsters as well. He's been doing it a lot. Jeff Lemire is everywhere right now, and as should be. Um, he is on my top five favorite creators in comics, I would say. Um, every time somebody's like, what should I read? I'm like, Jeff Lemire. Yeah. Let's just, just it, it's by Jeff Lemire, just buy it. It doesn't matter. Yeah. They're like, what's my favorite, what's the best version of this? And I'm like, the one Jeff Lemire did. Yeah. Like, it doesn't matter what you're even talking about. Whatever the trend is, just figure out whichever what story Jeff Lemire is telling in that trend. Because he does seem to, occasionally, when, like, vampires came back, he did a vampire book. And he always does it differently. Yes. He always finds the hole in the universe that everybody else is in. Like, oh, we're all writing vampire books? Okay, well, what if a bunch of little kids were turned into vampires and then left behind and never told how to be vampires? Or adults. Yeah. You know, you get that. Oh, we're going to tell a story about uh, uh, kids who wrote a story for D&D. Okay, well, guess what? They grew up and they disappeared. And you get that from yeah. Jeff. He always finds the thing. May's book, what if a dad got a message from his child and thought that they still existed and followed a string of yarn, literally followed a yarn to it. Like, he always finds the way to tell you a story that isn't out of the realm of what everybody else is talking about, but takes it in a completely different direction. Yeah. And Sorrentino's art is about direction. And so putting those two together, it's just phenomenal every time. Yeah, I this is one you definitely have to pick up. I even think that first issue was uh, like a speculator book for mm-hmm. a second. 
Absolutely. Um, I saw a bunch of people picking it up, and I was like, are you guys picking this up because you like the creative team? I will say, because it was a free comic book day issue, after the free comic book day issue, we were still in Austin, the amount of people who had never bought a Jeff Lemire book but read that first that free comic book day issue and came in and said, I want everything in this world. And I was like, well, the first thing's a hardcover. And they're like, I don't care. I'll pay for it. Everybody that I like gave that free comic book day book, I would say I had like at least a 40% turnaround of people coming in and saying, I don't care if the first thing's a hardcover, I'm buying it. And that's huge because most free comic book day books, people don't even read them nonetheless, yeah. come in and order them. And a hardcover being so much more expensive, people were like, no, I want it. I don't care. That free comic book day issue was so good. And so... I don't know if it was all that much a speculator thing or if it was uh, an actual, like, people just fell in love with this universe immediately. Yeah, yeah. Um, so good. I would just like to let you know that Nigel said that he looked it up and it is a Little Debbie product and he believes you've now let Little Debbie down and he's disappointed. Okay, hold on. Who's the one that is going in to the grocery store Twice a week <laughs> buying zebra cakes. <laughs> I think they can accept a, a, a minor mistake with the amount of money that they've they've I'm been getting saying. from me. So <laughs> Nigel's disappointed. I'm just saying. <laughs> All right, Nigel. Whatever. <laughs> um, Why don't you bring me zebra cakes, Nigel? Yeah, Nigel, you're not bringing anyone zebra cakes. Yeah, we're not gifting from Florida. Okay, uh, but Nigel did send wonderful, amazing presents this week, and we love you, Nigel. Uh, you have a birthday present from Nigel. Um, I think I know what it is. You probably do. Um, <laughs> up next is from Vault Comics is issue four of Mindset, which is once again an incredible book. Is this also Zach Kaplan? It is. It, it is. is. Yeah. Zach Kaplan, you are killing it. You are crushing uh, all of the things you are touching right now. Um, Mindset is one of those books that every time I don't put it in the picks of the week, I'm like, I screwed up. This should have been a pick of the week. And I will once again stand by that. This is um, a group of guys figure out while doing their research project that they have to do for their last thing as like m like in a le computer engineering kind of students, they figure out mind control. Um, and they're like, hey, we should create an app for this. And so they're like, what if we create an app that kind of negates everything that social media is doing. Because social media is all programming our mind. It's doing everything. It's making us buy things. Sorry I'm saying that. Please don't turn my stream off. Um, but it, that's what the book said. Um, but they're, they're telling you, like, oh, this is all this. What if we created an app? And on it, it actually, like, releases your control. And it just kind of makes you feel good. And it makes for a positive situation. And it stops all of this, like, negativity that we get in from all the things we're viewing. And it stops us from feeling like we're going to have to buy things. But much like everything else, um, it's like, hey, you have this app. It's amazing. I want it. I'm going to buy it from you. Hey, you have this app. We're going to do this with it. Hey, you're going to do this. And the whole story is being told by somebody who by the, the creator of it who is being interviewed by the police this entire thing has been a guy sitting there telling the police a story about some murders and we've gone back and he's telling us the story and it's crazy because you'll see stuff like in quotes a lot of the time and I'm like why is that in quotes and I'm like oh yeah because somebody's telling the story I totally forgot um and you go like we haven't because we haven't ever gone back to the police station after that first scene in like issue one where he showed us that he was telling us the story. So we're seeing it play out now. But it is this guy. And the whole concept is who is controlling who? RB could like by choosing to say that like, hey, we created this mind control situation. We we created but we wanted to not control people's minds. We were like, hey, we're going to do this and we're going to use it as a way to free you. But now he doesn't know if he's his mind's being controlled. He doesn't know if the code is controlling other people's minds. And as we see this start to play out over time, this is like a very dark version of the social network movie. Hmm. So if you liked the social network movie, you're seeing that kind of plot. But you're seeing it involve murder and mind control and all kinds of darker things. Uh, to the same point where he's like, I was on a press release. I was on a press tour and they changed all the code back home without consulting with me. And now everything's different and they brought people on the board. And so and so wanted to control the advertising. Like you see a lot of the same scenes you saw with the social network movie. 
Um, and but you're seeing it turned into like a completely darker, different version. Um, and it moves like that. It moves in that same slow process where you're like, uh, like this is a very like long, slow movie. And it's a drama. This is not an action book. This is not any of that. This is a long, like, drama. And it re there's a lot of writing in this book. There's a lot of story. And that's what I love about it. Um, but if you're one of those people who's like, I can't handle a lot of, a lot of storytelling in my comic books, it's not going to be for you. But if you're willing to take it on, you're going to read one of the best books on the shelf right now. All right. Like, so one of those like could have been a pick of the week. Always a pick of the week, not a pick of the week. It's one of those where I feel like I would talk too long if I put it in the picks of the week. So I'm like, just read it. Everybody should read it. Um, Fear of the Fun House from Archie Horror. Last week, our entire pick of the week. <laughs> Matt's, Matt's copying Zach Snaps. Uh, <laughs> last week, uh, we made our entire pick of the week just Archie Horror. And Matt was telling you that there was a new one shot coming out this week. And here it is. Um, this is all of the kids from Riverdale. Go The usual crew goes out on a camping trip. And they sit around the fire and they tell their horror stories. And, of course, they scare themselves um, into believing that everything is, that they've told in their stories is real. And it's Archie, so maybe it is. But you get a bunch of little vignettes of stories that, and uh, each one tells, Reggie tells a story, Archie tells a story, Jughead makes food. And, you know, the usual. Um, it's super great. I love it. It's one of the most adorable stories. If you are a fan of Archie, you need to pick it up and enjoy it because uh, this is just another fun Halloween book uh, to add to your collection. Archie always delivers on the horror. Always. And always. whether it's fun horror or, like, super dark horror, Archie is the best for all of it. Like, if I had to pick, the, like, for me, like, and The Great Pumpkin Charlie Brown is a, a phenomenal classic. Let's not ever, like, ever doubt that. But I always think of the Peanuts. I think of, you know, all the seasons. But when I think of Archie, I just think Halloween. Like, they always nail Halloween. And they just, they build up so many like they usually have one or more uh, books releasing every week in Halloween and so I always think of Archie as the Halloween extraordinary like book option I always feel like growing up though I saw more of uh, Christmas with Archie I feel like I was I always saw a lot of Archie around Christmas time all right Give they do have the digest we'll yeah we'll figure it out we'll, we'll weigh them up against each other Matt needs that. He hasn't read it yet. I put one on your desk. You have a copy on your desk. I just want to be dramatic. Okay. <laughs> That's fair. Um, from Silver Sprocket, we have Fruiting, Bo Bo Fruiting Bodies, and it is by Ashley Robin Franklin, who is a hometown Austin girl. Um, we love Ashley. Ashley, yeah, it's, it's foil, so you're going to have to shake it. Um, Ashley is always at the Lone Star Zine Fest with some incredible um incredible zines but we this is silver sprocket has been publishing all of ashley's work over the last couple of years and they are do, they just do such a great job uh and this particularly is a a story about a, a girl and her brother and her brother's best friend and the brother and the best friend are on their way to a camping trip in the pacific north northwest and the girl wants to go live with her new partner that she met on the internet. And so she hitches a ride in the car with them. And uh, in the car, the car runs out of gas. And of course, the the girl and the best, the brother's best friend hate each other. And so they run out of gas. They end up stuck in the woods. They're like, we're going to have to camp here overnight. And while they're camping overnight, they meet a random girl who says, like, her friends got lost in the woods and she doesn't know where they are. And uh, weird stuff starts happening. <laughs> And, uh, you know, it's one of those, like, I don't know if anybody's going to make it out of the woods. And when we find out what's happening with them, uh, it's crazy. Ashley does a really great job with these. These are, like, full stories contained. Um, like I said, Ashley's a great zine writer. And so that works really well for these, like, mini, like, chapbook size uh, graphic novels. They're so good. I love Ashley's work. We have quite a few. I think we have like at least three or four other titles from Ashley on the Silver Sprocket line. Um, highly recommend. And this is a great horror story. 
for the Halloween season. So if you need another book this week just to get you in the spooky mood, this is definitely a good one. Um, but it's also just a good, like, hey, we went camping in the woods and, and bad crap happened to us. This is another one of those that's just really good for that. Um, and for all of our, like, Austin friends, this is just a great uh, way to support an Austin creator. Yeah. I'm a Silver Sprocket. Always puts out really great stuff. Oh, yeah. Matt is obsessed with Silver Sprocket. If Silver Sprocket puts something out, uh, Matt Matt is on it. And I guess that actually was the launch of, like, our, our – our, uh, I guess the Archie was the launch of our one-shot slash number one section, and I totally didn't even think about the crossover oh, that we hit. Yeah. So, yeah, so we just had – uh, two of the three one-shot situations. This is actually listed as a trade paperback. It's another one that you're going to have to try to, like, technically cover probably some of it. Did you just read it? I did. This oh. was the first one I read. So, Fun Girl. You, oh, my God. This is the first time you read it. I love that. This is Fun Girl. You are revolting. Um, Fun Girl. Yes, another Silver Sparket book. And so, they actually had a, a, a free comic book date book for this uh, 2021. Oh, okay. And uh, everybody freaked out because they didn't realize that it was for adults because they thought it looked like it was little kids. And I was like, it's definitely not a little kid book. Nothing from Silver Sprocket is ever really for kids. Um, but Phil, tell them what Fun Girl's up to in this in this particular Yes, issue. so in this issue, uh, Fun Girl and uh, Peter, who is the boyfriend of her best friend slash no longer roommate uh, who went away to college... Uh, so they uh, have to rent out her room, mm -hmm. and uh, they rent it out to this uh, kind of uh, kooky lady who seems to be, uh, you know, kind of interesting and fun and and weird and all the things that I would uh, choose a, a person to rent a room for. Absolutely. Um, and you also have Peter, who's, like, struggling with his girlfriend being away. And uh, let's just say that this uh, this new renter kind of, uh, you know, makes things oddly interesting. Very interesting, very quickly. Um, again, a reminder, Fun Girl is not for children. This is it a, says mature audience. It is a highly mature audience book. Um, this is, like, we talk, <laughs> Phil's dying of laughter and I, I just, love it. Because of how this book ends. <laughs> the way this book ends is uh, incredibly amazing and highly sexual. So this is not for children in any capacity. Uh, that's why we're talking about it at 11 o'clock at night and not uh, in the morning. But if, you, uh, if you've never read Fun Girl, there is a free comic book day issue from 2021. We probably have. But if you are fans of that hardcore like pencil styling and those weird off the wall comics that Silver Sprock is known for I think uh, this is definitely one of those books that will entertain you I laughed the whole way through I had a really wonderful time Peter and his whole little side story and this is just great it's just really well done and I like this art style I kind of mm -hmm. like this like weird indie art style that yeah. Silver Sprocket usually lean stores but uh yeah this is this was a fun one shot and it's only 5.99 and it's a it's they yeah. actually like call it they call it a one shot and a trade paperback because there's so much to it um so if you're looking for an oversized book Ooh. that you can just get a full story out of 5.99 is it's not not a, a hefty price for getting a full story but you have to be ready for like lewd and ridiculous I'm telling you, this is one of the best endings. It was it was a great ending. A oh my god, Matt's like mine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was uh, it was it was a fun read. Uh, <laughs> the art obviously was what immediately made me say I wanted to read this book. Yeah, yeah, and it kicks like if you need to know why it's a mature audience book, it open the first open, page. open the first page, yeah. um, and you'll immediately be like, yeah, this is not for children at no. all and if you've never read silver sprocket start with everything sucks and work your way out from yeah there. yeah start with everything sucks and fantastic story just go nuts um, or visit their store i believe it's in portland um it's it's definitely in the pacific north northwest it, it, i think it's portland it might be seattle but it's somewhere up there uh silver sprocket actually does have a full like kind of like scout they have a comic book store but they do carry other titles 
Um, but they're based out of this one comic book store. And so you can get all the Silver Sprocket titles you need up at that store. Um, or you can check out other titles while Just you're there. Just wait till you get to the end. Oh, my God. You have no <laughs> idea until you get to the end. Uh, speaking of endings. Oh, okay. Silver Coin issue 15. This is from Image Comics. This is not the end, but it is. Uh, Michael Walsh and his wife are having a baby that is due this month. Um, if you've already had the baby, congratulations, Michael. If you have not, we wish you the best to you and your wife. Um, but Silver Coin is kind of wrapping up slash just going on a break. Um, he says it will return. But what's really cool is he kind of goes through like down a trip down memory lane with this issue of a bunch of the different stories. Um, because there's a lot of stories that have happened. Um, if you don't know, Silver Coin is kind of like a monkey's paw situation where people find the coin and something bad happens to them um, based on their wish fulfillment. And there was a lot of stories in the last 14 issues that you're like, how did they find the coin? That doesn't make any sense. Michael went through in this issue and had one man kind of being the person who planted the coin along the way for them and this is a guy who just really found what the coin could do fascinating and has been planting that coin of along the way um and then how does that affect you like if you're the person who is bringing this darkness to everybody how does it affect you to be the bearer of darkness and uh, michael kind of addresses all of that in this issue which is super cool um and then he drew himself in at the end that's like hi i'm the artist and the writer of some of the issues but you know the overall idea man behind silver coin and kind of tells you that he's he's going to take a break hopefully to come back after baby but the art on this has always been uh incredible michael does all the art on every single issue he usually brings in other creators but there's been quite a few that he he you know did himself and i love this this references the the kelly thompson issue it references the james tynion issue uh, just if they're like there's so many of the issues from the last 14 that he's kind of just like ran us through um which is a great way to go on a break slash possible ending to just say like hey these are all the wonderful things that have happened to us over the time and by wonderful i mean absolutely terrible and terrifying um if you haven't read silver coin highly recommend you can pick up any issue and just start there if you can find the james tynion issue definitely read that one i love the kelly thompson uh camp issue there are so many good ones jim sadarcy i think did issue one yeah, you did. yeah um issue speaking of issue ones from red five we have dead kingdom did you just read this one i did what yes. you think what, tell uh, them about it. you know obviously when i see red five i know it's a book that i have to read that's why um and so this is a story kind of set in the the time of nights and uh we've got zombies we've got zombies which if you didn't know the roman spqr handbook for all of the roman soldiers actually has an entire chapter dedicated to how to set up your camp in case the dead come back to life nice. so i'm 100 percent convinced that there might have actually been zombies during the roman empire because why else would they be concerned with writing a whole chapter in their handbook on how to deal with zombies coming back from like people coming back from the dead just saying. It's the whole thing. Go on. Uh, yeah, so I mean, this is basically the, hey, there could be, we something's going on. It seems like it could be a plague. Um, and uh, so they send out a group of knights to go out there and find out what it is. And like in every zombie story, you find out there's zombies. There's zombies. But we have a knight who is known as like peacekeeper. And that's insulting to the knights. They're very mad about the fact that he's the peaceful guy. Yeah. Uh, and yet, you know, he is the one with the backstory that I can't wait to hear. Because they keep referencing whatever he did in this town to keep the peace. And I wouldn't know what he did. Yeah. I want to know why everybody's making fun of him when he seems like the biggest badass on the team. I'm totally in. But also, we've got that star-crossed lover story going on because he's got a girl that he is in love with that he's not supposed to be in love with, and he told her in advance that she should get out of town. And now it's like, ooh, did she get out of town? Did she make it before this happened? I don't know, and it's Red 5, and you're going to do an incredible story. You wrote a story about pigeons that made me want to cry. It was so good. So I believe you can do anything at Red 5. Um, and I am super excited to see where this goes. Yeah, same, definitely. Yeah. Um, from a new publisher we've never talked about, Invader Comics, 
We have Back to Fairy Tale Ya issue one. Yes, Invader Comics, I gotta say, great site. Invader Comics shipped all of their books in mm. bags and boards. Superb start. Oh, wow. Holler at Invader Comics for putting your books in bags and boards. They also have a nice paper quality. They do have a really have great nice paper quality. nice glossy paper quality. Uh, I was really impressed. Uh, so this is the story of a group of kids who uh, sneak into the back of a of an area of a of an it looks like a, a an abandoned amusement park. amusement park and they found this little doorway uh, that takes them to Fairy Talia where they go on these crazy quests and fight all these fairy tale monsters and there's only one rule to Fairy Talia and that is we don't, don't talk about Fairy Talia don't talk about Fairy Talia and of course. The stupid little white boy. Who got knighted. Go he has to go tell yeah. all the people that he's the, the ultimate white boy in Veritalia. And he fucking ruins everything. And they had to <laughs> shut it down. They're like, hey, this guy who's like the gatekeeper to Veritalia, it's none of it's real. And he's actually just been diddling these children. And it creates this whole mess. The whole mess. This whole mess. Zach. I want you to read this because he actually, they are, are convinced because he goes, he tells his parents, he tells the counselor, he keeps talking to all these different people and he keeps holding to the fact that his story is true. So he ends up getting sent to a, a home for children who have mental illnesses. And the whole time he's in there, he's like, no, I went to this place. And he keeps telling these stories about this incredible place. And it shows what happens to all the other kids who believed in this magic as well. And kind of their whole lives got flipped upside down because of his decision to tell somebody. And we see these other kids like in like little montages of their life. And then it fast forwards to him being an adult and them saying, Look, you're never going to get out of here until you tell us you don't believe in fairy tale yet. And he's like, fine. I don't believe in it. And it's such an interesting, like, this whole thing is going to be this psychological study. But also, like, now it's like, okay, so are we against using our imagination? Because the whole point was like, no, let children use their imaginations. And now this one kid who ruined it for everybody is like, imagination isn't real. And as somebody whose imaginary friend went on to star <laughs> in a Hollywood TV show on the Disney Channel, I am offended by his reaction. Stop laughing at me, Phil. It happened. I have video proof of the fact that he was on TV. It's a thing. <laughs> this is not two bottles of wine talking. That is actually just sober Shannon telling you that uh, my imaginary friend was on TV. But I don't know if two bottles of wine constitutes you as sober Shannon. No, I'm saying that. sober Shannon would also tell you this oh, story. Okay, okay. My imaginary I'll have, friend. I'll was, ask sober Shannon. Uh, oh my god, have you never heard the story of my imaginary friend getting on TV? I'll tell you when we're off. It's after the show, I'll tell you. This is fantastic. Yes, You're doing a great job. I This is one of those books where I'm like, I have to go in right now and make sure I ordered issue two because uh, it's one of those that's only going to be an IO comic, and it was mm. such a good book. I can't wait to see yeah. what happens with issue two. Um, and I, this yeah. psychological study of adults not trusting kids to talk about their imagination and taking advantage of like oh well kids living in their imaginary worlds so we have to shut it down because kids can't have imagination this had a huge the whole two-thirds of this comic was just about not trusting kids to explore their imagination and it was such a good story in that um but also this this squirrel can you show them in the back i'm in for this squirrel yeah, he's like the Nick Fury of fairy tale. Yeah, mm -hmm. a squirrel that's and I'm not eating us like our kid at at our camp, our workshop yesterday oh my told gosh. us. We had a kid at our workshop yesterday who told us his ultimate death is to have birds peck him until he's bleeding out, and then squirrels eat him. So <laughs> are squirrels carnivorous? No. Okay. <laughs> but, so he leading up to his death, he has to train squirrels to be interested in human flesh yeah it's gonna be all a thing look kid if I you need like help a bad trend to start tell, I, tell I, them I, offer to help kids oh, with <laughs> training squirrels to eat things we're not doing that that's not a part of our organization all right kids separate workshop in the back alley of no, bat city no, comics not on our property at all i know this is in the parking me. lot no. next to bat city I will be teaching you how, to train, how to train squirrels. 
we're gonna human flesh. We're gonna talk about the. <laughs> this is Eve, Children of the Moon, issue one. Uh, this is the story. Uh, this is volume two of Eve from Boom Studios. I am so excited. I had no idea we were getting a volume two of Eve until a couple, like, until I ordered it, honestly. Um, and I'm super excited. Eve is the story of a young girl whose dad is, like, the chief environmental scientist who's supposed to save the world from climate change. And his solution is he cryogenically freezes his daughter and leaves her on Earth to do all of the work, essentially, while they leave. And she's, like, eight, by the way. And then he le- he programs her teddy bear to be her guide. Well, in ish- in volume one, teddy bear goes crazy uh, and starts becoming a psychopathic killer. And she's trying to save the world, and teddy bear is killing everybody. Great story. Fantastic. Now we're at volume two of this, and Eve has found um, more of her family, essentially. And she is... Uh, trying to help the world and she's reaching out to all these kids and all these other people who are actually still on the earth and she's trying to help them rebuild the earth and in this particular issue we come across a group of people who uh, specifically have it out for Eve and after all that she's been through there's an entire group that thinks Eve is a traitor and they know of her and they've been studying her. And the reason that they have not taken her assistance yet is because they hate her and they want to destroy her and her teddy bear. Um, I love this book. It's great. It is actually written by a gentleman whose wife is a client, a climatologist. Oh, okay. um, and so they, it was one of those, like, I've always wanted to write a story for my kids about climate change and like what like she does. And so it's it's fully based in in a lot of science. It's one of those comics where it's like, ooh, this is a great opportunity to talk about the actual science behind things, and while also giving um, a woman of color and a child of color a great opportunity to be the central character in a story. It's been so good. If you haven't read Eve Volume One, we have it. We're going to talk about it in a second um, in our trades. But yes, you should definitely read it. Um, up next we have. Issue one of Alpha Betas, which is the first book on the new What Not publishing line. Yes. They have now gone from online sales and auctions into the world of publishing. Which you may know if you've been to any of the big conventions in the last couple months, like New York and things like that. They had a huge booth to talk about um, all of their stuff. And this is their first, first of many. They have, I think I've already ordered like two or three titles from whatnot. Uh, but this is written by Kyle Starks, who we love from a lot of different books, but yes. what, what's going on in this book? Uh, so this is the story of four friends who like to play video games, kind of your questing Call of Duty style games. And, um, in this game, they discover that there is a wall in the game that tells them, hey, you can't go beyond this point, stay away from this point, there's no need to go here. Um, and that kind of opens up um, a very interesting, uh, oh, there's a lot more going on in this video game than uh, we were expecting. Um, but yeah, you kind of get like your four kind of goofy friends. Um, you know, this reads to me very much like Rick and Morty, but more on, like, a family guy side. Yes. So, that's fair. Uh, what's uh, Seth MacFarlane? It's like if Seth MacFarlane took over Rick and Morty. Yeah. It's, uh, they, at one point, they sing a song about shooting the bad guys in the butts. They do. They sing, shoot them in the butts. Um, but yeah, and so now we're going to kind of see these four kids now maybe have to become the reluctant hero. Um, but yeah, I, this is, uh, I like Kyle Sarks, but I feel like the dialogue in this book is kind of bad. Now, Kyle Sarks did do the Rick and Morty books at the beginning. Yes. So it makes sense that this feels very Rick and Morty. It also, um, I know the Rick and Morty books are something that when even when we did what not books like that was one of those things that or what nights tells a lot of people, people did talk Rick about and Rick and Morty. Morty. So it makes sense that he kind of went back to his Rick and Morty roots. Um, I was hoping for more six sides cakes of of Trigger Keaton, Dead of Winter, things like that. I was hoping for more of that. We definitely got more of the Rick and Morty side, but also it does feel it doesn't 
it, it does feel like they kind of aged it down a little bit too. Um, yeah. but it's still kind of crass humor, kind of like you said, like it almost feels like a family guy in the level of it. Um, it's an interesting book. I do like the concept though. I like the I idea too. because there's a, you know, there is this whole government, uh, undertone of things that people are like, the government is manipulating this video game and the government is also manipulating all of us. And it's kind of, Hey, let's look at this and let's figure out like what we, what's going on. I'm interested to see how that side of the story plays out, but I want to see if it's going to actually play out or if it's going to be yeah. a joke that they write off in the next issue. Yeah, I I am curious to see where this goes, mm-hmm. and I'm actually uh, more intrigued by uh, the the preview of another one. But like, let me read you some of this dialogue because this is a joke that I have heard in so many animated shows. Uh, but it's this lady who's kind of the head of this corporation talking to one of her cronies and she goes, yes, I'm fine, Stephen. I'm just under constant stress and my husband lately has a better chance of discovering cold fusion than finding my G spot. I've heard that joke a million times to the point where when I heard it in this, I was like, all right, whatever. Yeah. But that's the kind of humor you're going to get, where it feels like it's very recycled. Mm-hmm. Um, it feels like a lot of jokes that you've heard a million times before. Um, but the the concept is there. Right. The concept fills Kyle Starks. The yes. dialogue doesn't. And actually... Okay. Yeah, and it's based on a series created by other people. Yeah. And so I wonder if that's kind of like... Where, where this all falls. I want to see how it all plays out. I want to see what, what we're doing with it. Um, because it is, it's an interesting, it's an interesting mix of things. And I want to see also, if this is like what, what not is going to be publishing. If this is where they want to fall. <clears throat> like, are they going to take this Oni Press kind of route? Um, with some of these properties or if they're going to go um, in a different direction. There are some really good options that are listed coming up from them. I'm so this is the art for um, a book called Quested that they're going to put out. And yeah. this I'm, I'm, I'm in. Yeah. Um, I wasn't expecting this from whatnot. I did not think at any point that they would decide to go down. The, the publishing, publishing route. route. Yeah. Because they are like to advertise that they're not just about comic books. But then now it seems like they're like, no, we're going to go fully into comics. Yeah. Yeah. I'll be, I'll be kind of curious to see where it goes. I'm going to keep an eye on it because, mm-hmm. you know, uh, the people. Uh, this is just not what I was expecting from the people who created whatnot. No, in the beginning. not at all. Um, but I know Jack Tomato is a huge comic book fan and loves loves the idea of comic books. So, you know, maybe maybe this is one of Jack's things that he also yeah. was pushing for. And I'm, I'm curious to see where they go um, and how it does. And, I mean, you're getting they're getting a lot of names to come in and, and play ball with them. And I want to see I want to kind of see if anybody shoots for the fences. Yeah. Or if it's all about like bunting and seeing what this is cool because they are doing a different video game cover for every issue because it is a video game thing. So there's like a Legend of Zelda um, and all kinds of upcoming every issue will have a different video game cover uh, for a classic video game. So I'm kind of curious to see just also is it going to be. Hey, we're we're trading on the spec situation of it, or are we actually trading on the stories? Um, I'm 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 very curious. Let's oh, see. they have a book called Ninja Funk that's got yes. a David Mack. Cover. Yes, David Mack is doing covers on every issue for that. Whoa! Yeah, okay. we're right. we'll see. I'm curious. All right. Speaking of being curious and talking about things, we're gonna jump into uh, the <laughs> Abolition of Man, which is really I think it says it's Living Line Publishing. I really feel like uh, this has been kind of a diamond thing diamond's been really yeah. pushing this yeah. this is uh an ai art story with uh the actual c.s lewis ai art is computer generated art so this is this is the first if you're a speculator just so you know this is the very first entirely computer generated art on a comic book nice. uh basically they took c.s lewis's story the abolition of man and they inputted it line by line into a computer to, bless you, uh, to let AI generate the art on it. So it's, hey, here's a line from this essay about men, the fall of man. Uh, and here, and we take the image that it generated with that line and we put it together. And that, and uh, that's, that's the story. And I believe it's two issues. No, it's five issues. Wow. 
That yeah. is, I forgot how long that essay was. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, it is, um, and they take each one of those like segments of this essay, basically. It is line by line. And so you get about six panels per page. I think it's always six panels per page. Um, and it's, it's all this art that's made. And I know this is a huge thing in the comic book industry. This was announced as well as a couple other things that are using this artificial intelligence geared art and a lot of comic book artists are are very rightfully i would say upset about where this is going and the idea of of artificial intelligence art um but this is interesting because the concept of using a c.s lewis essay to start with um is and the fall of man the idea of doing the abolition of man as your first book that's completely computer generated is already a psychological like mind trip that you're you're already playing with us like hey the fall of man essentially while we let the robots take over uh this is kind of how that felt um but i don't know how how much did you absorb of this oh, what are your thoughts i didn't read a single line of this because i remember reading that cs lewis book in high school and thinking this is awful and i never need to read it again why do i i honestly i don't even think i read the whole book i think i spark notes the second half of that thing um and so no i mean i looked at all the art i was very curious um to kind of see how this was gonna work um i've downloaded i downloaded one of the ai generator apps um and it was nothing to this degree um uh, but this is done with uh, Mid Journey, which was uh, created by a, a major corporation. So I think it's a little bit more intricate. Um, I think it can do a little bit more. Um, but I mean, as you can see, it's I still feel like it's very limited. Like mm -hmm. there's there's kind of starting to put in a bunch of different art styles, but um, it's very limited. Um, and you're going to get kind of more like abstract versions of things. Um, this is definitely a program that's a little bit more intense because it is more detailed and there's a lot more to it in each of these panels. Um, but I'm very curious to see if this opens a floodgate or not. Yeah, I'm really curious to see what comes of this. I studied C.S. Lewis in college. Um, and so also just, I, I actually, I, I said earlier today in the store that I would love to take this series once it's done between the concept of having a computer generate the art and the story about the fall of man and everything that's wrong with men. I'd love to have a book club where we just actually talked about that and, and just like, Hey, we're actually giving, we, we didn't even invite man to be a part of this story essentially. Yeah. Um, and I'd love to have a conversation about that, but you'd basically be like, Hey, we're going to read three pages of this book today because you're never going to want to read the whole thing and one sit through. Yeah. Um, if you've never read this book, this is a very lofty, very philosophical story. Um, and it's re it's really not even a book. It's just an essay from C.S. Lewis. Dense. It is a very, very dense essay. And um, if you, you're going to, you're going to get a lot and everything is like, every third line is like, but what is man? Like, but where is man? And so it's one of those where it's like, it would be amazing to do three pages and then have a conversation and then three pages and have a conversation that you would never want to, like, it would be impossible to sit down and read the whole thing and not have somebody to talk to you about it. Because it's meant to be talked about. And so if you buy this, don't try to read it all in one sitting. Don't try to absorb it all. The, the illustrations do work really well with line-by-line -line interpretations of what is being said. Like if you read it and then you look at the art, but this is going to an art gallery. This is not reading a comic book. This is going to an art gallery and, and that is the question that is being posed by the painting. It is, it is not reading a comic. This is, I, I'm looking at this painting and the question that's being posed, I'm going to, I'm going to read one of them to you. This is, where's that one? Where, um, oh my gosh, let's see if I can find it. Um, even this, like, this is like a picture of a man standing on the cliffside or whatever. And he's like, evaluating himself. And Matt, tell me when you've seen it, because I need to read the question. It is, 
the question on it, or the line on this, from this point of view, what we call man's power over nature, it turns out to be a power exercised by some men over other men with nature as its instrument. That is the question of the painting. That is not a comic book story. That is, a, I am staring at this incredible piece of art in a gallery and I am thinking, what did man use nature for to overturn somebody else? And so that's why I'm like, I would love to sit down and talk about the art and the story with somebody, but I would never sit down and read this book all the way through by myself just for like the fun of comics. This yeah. isn't a fun of comics. This is a, I went to an art gallery and I studied it. And honestly, like a curriculum coming out of this would be a thing more so than uh, that. However, on a speculator side, if you want the first ever comic book done entirely by computer generation, you should probably own this. Who's the publisher? It's living the line, but it is 100% pushed by Diamond. Diamond at all times. This they is teamed up with Diamond. Diamond. It's Diamond. Diamond, Diamond, Diamond. Diamond is running so many ads for this right now. Yeah. This is... Does it even say that they're part of it? I don't know if it does, um, but it is all over um, their personal... Like, the website is... It was like a banner ad. It's banner ad every day, all day, on Diamond's page. It doesn't so, even say that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's distributed exclusively by diamonds, mm -hmm. but the publisher is living alone. Yeah, yes. so it's a it's a great conversation. Honestly, Matt, if you want to have a, a read through together, I'm in to have this this philosophical conversation. I have a lot of conversation that I would love to have about C.S. Lewis in general because uh, uh, pass. I have a. You like C.S. Lewis? Love C.S. Lewis. I I. This is why I don't hang around the shop as much. One of the best. I. <laughs> I have an English degree from a Christian university, and I'm going to strongly disagree with you. Um, but if you, like... Strongly disagree with his Matt, love for C.S. Lewis? No, I, I... But I was talking, I think, to Zach about this earlier today. I took a Christianity and literature class, and one of the things that we did is we dissected the, the book that everybody knew was overtly Christian. So for C.S. Lewis, we talked about Narnia. And then we read something like Out of the Silent Planet, which was a sci-fi novel by C.S. Lewis, and we talked about how a, a, a person who we knew was overtly Christian and put those philosophies in this one book that everybody knew, what did they do in this book that people didn't necessarily know and wasn't the one that everybody talked about? And we talked about how those kind of philosophies still show and in, internally versus overtly um, and what the writing put into it. And so that's why I'm like, I would love to have a conversation about this book in, in detail with you anytime, babe. This art is very Dave McKean. If you like Dave I too see that. stuff, it's very Dave McKean. I see that a lot. But it was created by a computer. But created I, by a I computer. I can't believe that they, they created this based off these like By lines. those lines. It's like you inputted the line wow. and then you told that story. It's, it's an It's a fascinating journey. Again, read it in pieces. Uh, if you try to read it all at one time, at you're not going to love it. Yeah, or just look at the art. Or, and, and then use it as a pensive question. Like look at one picture a day. For the next 300 days or something. Uh, lastly, in our new books this week, our hot new titles. Uh, I feel like we don't have the TV anymore, so I have to remind you that we're talking about hot yeah. new titles. Uh, this is a one-shot, possibly like a backdoor pilot to a series. Maybe. Um, I could definitely see how it's a setup um, called Hyper Aware. And this is by Jonathan Hedrick, which might I mention... Jonathan Hedrick, who is the author of The Recount, will be here in December with his wife, Francesca, who is the artist on stake. So we are having a beautiful scout experience um, with some of my, one of my favorite writers and one of my favorite artists coming together. I didn't even know they were married until they asked if they could come together. Jonathan wrote this incredible book, um, and here we are. Um, and that's your secret that they are coming in December. Can't wait. Uh, full announcement coming soon. I know. Where's the announcement? Uh, but tell them what this is about, Phil. Uh, so this is a story of uh, three people who are on a spaceship together. And uh, the guy who is the captain kind of uh, pushes buttons. And uh, you find out that maybe there was a bit of a love triangle. Yeah. Uh, taking place on this spacecraft 
Um, so it kind of goes through and, you know, she talks about how she feels guilty and, um, but at the same time, their life's at stake because the ship has taken a ton of damage. And, uh, so they got to make some, some tough decisions. And let me just say, uh, there was a good chunk of, I don't think I can show that. Uh, there was, there wasn't any time for nudity. Um, I could not tell where this book was going. And once the whole like love triangle was revealed, I was like, I don't really think I care for this book. And then how it ends, I'm like, oh yeah, totally. Yeah, I was like, oh okay, there's a love triangle, and I kind of like fell off. And then it was like, hey, we're doing this thing, and then the thing happened, and I, and then it twisted again, and I was like, yeah. freaking Jonathan, every time, every time that man gets me, like here we are, and I was like, where are you going with this? And it's so good, I don't want to ruin it. Because everything that happens in the back, like, third of this book, I was like, oh, 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 like, yeah. wait, we're doing this. Okay. Uh, such a cool twist at the end. Um, and, uh, I mean, Source Point is one of those publishers that we love. Love to see it. Um, I love Jonathan, and I love the things that Jonathan creates. I think Jonathan has this this mind that's full of these amazing one shots and then a uh, great series which if you didn't see the announcement this week we are officially getting a volume two of the recount nice uh which terrifies me and makes me uh love it so much i the recount was one of i always call it the most terrifying book that i read in 2020 but it is also one of the best books i read in 2020 and um i got the chance to have a conversation with our our good friend j2 and jonathan uh it was such an awesome experience to get to learn about how he came up with the concept and what he did with uh the recount i can't wait to get to explore that even more um jonathan only lives a few hours away so i'm so excited that him and francesca are going to be uh able to hang out here with us but if you didn't pick up hyper aware this week it's a one shot possibly a back to our pilot we could see more coming from this i would love to see more coming from how this plays out um and if you uh, did pick it up i'd love to know what you thought because um so source points kind of leaning into these like one shots and doing a lot of these recently and i want to see um I want to see even more. Yeah. Yeah. Hyper aware. One shot, allegedly. Uh, all right. So we got a pick of the week, some picks of the weeks. Uh, I'm going to let you start. Speaking of tough, of, of a source point one shots. Yes. We have tough stuff, which is basically an 80s action movie filled with drugs and violence and craziness, but it's if your lead character was a cat. I literally read two pages in this book and then said, this is Phil's Pick of the Week. And here we are on Sunday. And what is it? It's the Pick of the Week. <laughs> um, I, the, moment, I mean, the moment I saw uh, people posting about it, um, I knew it was going to be a Pick of the Week. It's wonderful. I mean, you essentially have the main character, Tough, who uh, loves drugs. He loves drugs. He wants to get his life together, but he just loves drugs. And uh, But doesn't like to buy them, likes to find them. Yeah, Because yeah. he's a cat, so he, he like forages. He, he likes to find them, but what's happened is there is an, a, a, an infection, kind of a plague that um, <clears throat> falls upon this city, and um, it's kind of keeping him from doing his drugs. And so, of course, he's got to go out and shoot his way through <laughs> and his girlfriend was mad that all he does is drugs and he doesn't get a job so he gets a job he tries yeah he tries yeah. to be a responsible citizen but in the process of doing that he finds the people who are um causing the drugs to disappear from the city and not in a good way they're like gang members like they're like an italian mob who's trying to like mm. stop like they want to control everything and tough is like uh not on my watch yeah. Uh, also, key point, Tuff is the only cat with a metal arm that includes a human thumb. Well, it's a it's a human hand. It's a it's a metal human hand. Um, so he has opposable thumb. So he has he one has opposable one, thumb. One opposable thumb. Which is all you need to hold a gun. According to Tuff. Yeah. I mean it's got everything. Everything you could ask for. Especially if you love those like cheesy eighties movies, which that are just like us. way, way over the top. 
I want Nicolas Cage to voice tough oh, in a movie so that you'll God. die. Oh my God. <laughs> That's all I could ask for. It would make your lifetime and it's fantastic. This was, it was a lot of fun, honestly. Like, like those are, we, we talk about Heavy Metal Drummer being like, you, we always make the joke that our, our closed captioning on Heavy Metal Drummer only said that this book is about cocaine and cats and what else do you need? But this is actually literally a story that is just about a drug yeah. doing cat and who is an 80s action star. There's also a great little scene, I'm not going to say what it's about, but there's a little scene where a couple of characters take ecstasy together and uh, it's great. Yeah. It's, I, it's just... This is what comics is all about, if I'm being entirely honest with you. This is why I wake up and read comics. I literally, I was laughing so hard because I started reading, like, random lines out loud to the store. And Josh was like, yep, Phil's pick. And, like, everybody was like, oh, are you reading Phil's pick when I would read a line from the comic? And I'm like, I love that everybody just knows. Because it's also a cat. And if you don't know Wednesday Phil, you don't know that, like, his best friend in the whole wide world is a cat. <laughs> And that's not a that's not a joke. Like your best friend in the entire world is a cat. Like, and and so anything that stars a cat is automatically top tier. Yeah. And then you make it an eighties action film about a cat with an opposable thumb, a mechanical arm. Like he's like Winter Soldier in the eighties, uh, but also he's obsessed with drugs. And the whole thing is he just wants to get his drugs back. And it, it's just, it's, you know, it's it's great. It's it, hilarious. It ticks all the boxes. Right. Everything Twice. that Phil needs. Totally. It's like someone went and ticked all the boxes and then someone went back over it. And like highlighted them. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, I don't know if you could tell these boxes were ticked, but. And then it's by them. Source Point. On top of that, it's a yeah. Source Point book. So it's like, oh, Phil's in. Phil's 100%. Yeah, this, this was everything I could ask for in a comic. Yeah. Plus more. Like it, it. There's so much. It's so much fun, and it's thicker. It's probably like 48 pages. Yeah, it's long. Um, and I'd like to see more of this, and I think we will. I think we're gonna get more tough stuff. I think it said like tough stuff will return. <laughs> well, it says he's gonna return by going to rehab. They're yeah, like, he's coming back. And I'm to in. Go to rehab. I want to see tough stuff go to rehab. Do it. I'm no, here for it. No, I'm here I want to see more drug it's, abuse. It's, 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 he's gonna be. He's not gonna get better. No. No, and that's I why I want to see him. I want to see him. Yeah. Uh, and uh, speaking of things that tick all the boxes for people, also from Source Point, apparently oh, the pick of I didn't, the, I didn't either. either. <laughs> apparently, pick of the week is just Source Point. Yeah, shout um, out to you, Source Point. Yeah, always doing some stuff. Um, this is a book that I read it and was like immediately, this is my pick of the week, and I was like, Phil, add this to your must read pile. Um, this is a issue one of Postmasters, and what I for me. I am the opposite of Phil, I guess, if you go off of the tough stuff thing. Um, I want that, like, I want you to talk about politics. I want you to get philosophical in your book. But, like, if you do it through action and a really cool story, uh, who also features a badass female, I'm 100% sold. And Postmasters ch checked all of my boxes immediately. Um, it starts with literally talking about the COVID pandemic um, and how a lot of people denied the science of it and didn't want to follow through with everything. I guess they don't call it COVID, they just call it a pandemic. A flu-like pandemic that sped through the world. world. And um, because of that, they had to set up certain sections of the world for people who who didn't believe in it. And then those people basically became like zombies from the virus. And um, things get out of hand and the only people who still travel between the world like the different cities as well as these outlying certain communities are the male people who are delivering packages and i thought of you phil and because i was like phil as my fedex driver would continue to deliver packages through all of this stuff because you're the only fedex driver i know who delivers on weekends and actually makes your deliveries uh but we follow this one particular person who actually like he followed all the rules and yet still ended up possibly like oh, completely immunocompromised from the whole situation and yet he became a postmaster which they basically consider a suicide mission and he is the best that they have he goes to all the dark places he is willing to fight anything to deliver the mail and in this particular issue he is handed a letter 
and it's told he has to deliver it and where they're sending him is known as like the most dangerous place and he may or not make it out alive we see him faced uh face a bunch of people who are here to kill him and all of the stuff gets dangerous and we introduce our new character before the end of the book who is the most badass of all of them uh i love her she's incredible i can't wait to see anything about her in the next issue the thing for me about this book is that it's very manga, both in the mm-hmm. style of art, but also in the style of writing. It Absolutely. It feels very much like I'm writing a manga. And um, I, I like everything about it. The main character, 32, uh, you know, who's just running around being a total badass, but all just to deliver mail. Yeah. Um, it's it's a really great book. It, it has everything that I could ask for. And like, much like you... Um, the last few pages where we introduce this new character is just like it's great um i was like two pages in where i was already like this is my pick of the week yeah, and yeah, then it i long. got to the end and it was like i have made an excellent choice yeah. like this is a great book uh 100 percent. when you get to those last few pages you're like i there's no not like there's no going back i'm 100 percent sold but you're right it does feel very it does feel very manga and i'm not normally a manga reader but this, it, it does feel that way, and I was still, really, I was really drawn. Like, it's immediate character development that I was like, whatever this guy's doing, I'm following him. Like, yeah. I'm in for it. Yeah, same. But, I mean, the art on this book is great. The storytelling is great. Um, I like the world that's being built mm-hmm. here. It's, it's a lot of fun. You know, it's great commentary on the COVID pandemic and, and kind of, um, very interesting because also too like there's comments about how like the pandemic was just the beginning of it and there's also kind of like this um, like it, it kind of leads to a lot of other things and like the government falling apart and like society not trusting anybody again like it was very much somebody thinking about where this could go not yeah. necessarily where it did go but where it could still go um, and, and a lot of these books, you know, it does take a really, really long time, especially with our paper shortages for them to come out. So we're going to see a lot of books that start talking about, uh, the pandemic. We've seen a lot of the, the vampire books that have used that, uh, emo girl yeah. specifically talked about it. Uh, it's talking about a small press book. We're going to see a lot of books that start to reference that. And it's incredible to see like this time capsule because for our lives, like, you know, a lot of the political drama does seem to come into play in comic books, but we've never, we have, you know, we had September 11th, but we haven't had something like the bubonic plague, right. uh, which seems to continue to come back in comics a lot all the time. And so now to see this, you know, okay, how many people are going to start using COVID and to see somebody use COVID and then kind of like push it to like, what if it would have kept going? Yeah. What if it would have been worse? What if it could, like, it was already bad, but what if it would have been worse? Yeah. What if we would have gone to the extremes on this and, and getting to see somebody actually push that and, and then still give the mail, like using the mail as it. And we talk yeah. about, we talked about space bastards a lot on the show as like this over the top people who delivered the mail kind of situation. And they became like mercenaries for the mail. And this is kind of like, what if you did that seriously? What if it was like, Hey, we still have to have a society. And it's interesting that when we do talk about all these books, having a standardized mail system seems to be what we consider the basis of a society. Yeah. And um, I kind of love that support for the USPS that everybody's <laughs> giving out. That and 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 delivery people in general, like I said, like Phil, you deliver all even on the weekends. I love kind of seeing that, like the ability to communicate with everybody else at a basic level will always be the basis of a society. Yeah. Like, hey, the internet could be gone, cell phones could be gone, but whether or not we can like actually still send some form of communication from one person to another will always be our base level of communication. And the structure of society seems to be a really cool concept that we've built so much technologically, but we're like, hey, let's fundamentally take this back. Yeah. And we get that in books like this. And I'm in. I'm. I'm one. I 100 can't wait to see where these characters go and where the story goes. And Source Point very rarely has ever let. Like they, they haven't let me down. Honestly, yeah. um, to put that on. Shout out to you, Source Point. Yeah. Both doing- of our picks of the week were by you. Yes, but I will throw in uh, one last pick of the week. This is Matt's continual life pick of the week. 
uh, and reminder that Andrea Moody is uh, coming out this Saturday, October 29th. Uh, he'll be here from 12 to 3 to sign copies of Bunny Mask. I'm trying really hard not to touch this book at all. If you've never read Bunny Mask, it is one of Matt's favorite comic books. Um, is that a first print? This is a first print. That's why I'm not touching it. Um, this is a first print. We have lots of them, uh, uh, available if you would like to get Andrea to sign them. This is the story, basically, of, uh, if, what if the little, the girl that comes crawling out of the TV of the ring, the demon Japanese water ghost from the ring, was your best friend, um, and was kind of trying to help you, like, build the life that you needed? This is that story. Um, I love this book. It's fantastic. Somebody, somebody just asked me, uh, my, my, one of my best friends, uh, Anna Maria just asked me, what should I read for Andrea coming next weekend? I was like, dude, you haven't read Bunny Mask. You should read Bunny Mask. Um, so sorry if you can't sleep. Uh, I don't know your horror level, Anna Maria, but I hope you read it. Um, this book is fantastic. Uh, Andrea will be here from 12 to 3, signing copies of this. $5 for a signature, $10 for a remark, which is incredible. Um, and then uh, there are CGC witnessing options. We'll, we'll talk to you about that that day. Or if you're looking to uh, send, you know, get something and you're not here, shoot us a message. Um, and shoot Matt directly a message because he'll be handling all of that that day. Um, we are super excited for that. So, uh, Also, Uncle Jim said hi. Hi, Uncle Jim. Um, uh, all right, we got some books that are in stock this week. We're going to power through these really fast because I know Phil has to work early in the morning, possibly, maybe. I, I do, don't know. Yes, all right, yes. we're going to power through these fast for Phil. Uh, Destiny, uh, New York, also Pat Shan, with art by Yolanda Zanf Sanfordino, who I am obsessed with. Um, Yolanda, if you, you heard that right now, I will reiterate, <laughs> obsessed. Um, this is a one-shot Halloween special. This is one of those, though, that if you haven't been reading Destiny of New York, you might be a little lost, but if you are reading Destiny of New York, it's incredible to jump back into that world, because we've had a little bit of a, of a, of a delay. Uh, yeah. I wouldn't say delay. I guess we're on a, we're on a trade break, is really where we are. But Destiny of New York is the story of an academy for students who are all the chosen ones. There's even, like, a random reference to Harry Potter going there. It's hilarious. Of course. Uh, the Marked. This is a Halloween special as well. Um, if you haven't read The Marked, it is about a world where uh, they have tattoos. The tattoos give them powers, and they use those powers to kind of, um, you know, stop bad guys. There's a point where um, one of them betrays them to the government, and things get crazy. This is a really cool story. If you are fans of Mortal Instruments, the YA novels by Cassie Clare, you would love this book. Um, one of my favorite series of all time, somebody asked me what my favorite James Heinen book was the other day, and I was like, I think it's Still Wind. Uh, and this was voted the Bat City favorite book of yes, 2020. Uh, this is volume three. This is Wind, Throne in the Sky. This is issue three. Um, is it three? Is it two? Yeah, three. I didn't cry. Oh, my God. This is the first <laughs> issue three of a wind volume that I didn't cry at. So James Tiny is going to break my heart in the next issue because he's holding out and I'm scared. But wind is one of the greatest things James Tiny has ever done. If you haven't read it, just just do it. Just do yourself a favor. It's amazing. Um, public domain issue right. five. Yes. Chip Zdarsky doing everything by himself. And really just commentating on the comic book industry. This is the story of a, a Jack Kirby kind of character who um, tries to get his rights back from the Stan Lee who, who, who stole them all. Uh, <laughs> it's just what it is. It's, it is what it is. Um, Miracle Man, The Silver Age. This is the Miracle Man team of Mark Buckingham and uh, Neil Gaiman back together to do a book. Um, and they call it Book 5, The Silver Age. This is just kind of the continuation of where they left off. It even has the legacy numbers on it. Yes, yeah, this picks up where it left off, which uh, is, is issue 23. So if you're reading that initial run, get back into it. Stoked that Miracle Man is back. Um, you might not be able to show this cover, so I'm going to skip that. Um, Heaven's Rejects, issue 2 from Soyce Point Press. If you wanted to know what it would be like to have Charlie's Angels, but with actual angels, this is it. This is... The most Charlie's Angels. Yeah. Um, Promethe 13, 13 from Ablaze. This is uh, your, like, alien sci-fi book. Um, and this is issue four? Five? Where are we at? Four. Four. Um, 
Triskel, issue five. This is from Scout Comics. This is one of those high fantasy books about a bunch of kids who make some poor decisions in a fantasy world. Uh, 78 miles per hour. This is from Stonebot from Red 5. This is issue three. I know you missed issue two as well, mm -hmm. which is why I didn't give you this. Um, but this is a, a kind of a Mad Max situation where a bunch of people are in cars and they have to keep moving and a bunch of crazy stuff happens along the way. And I read this issue without reading issue two and I'm like, oh my God, what the hell happened in issue two? Uh, so a lot happens in every issue yeah. just for the record. Um, and Stonebot, so it's great. Above Snakes, issue four. Uh, this is from Image. This is Hayden Sherman on art. So you want to show them? It looks incredible. I don't mind if you if you show them for a second. Hayden Sherman. Just sh let him show off. Um, this is about a guy and his crow friend dealing with some stuff. And Josh, I said, oh, I'm reading this book. And Josh was like, is it the, the crow sex book where the crows were trying to mate? And I was like, no, that's Above Snakes. So... You know, if you want to see some crows fall in love with each other, it happens in this book. Um, Aquaman Andromeda, DC. This is book three. This is from Ran V and Christian Ward. Another one where you should just show them what the inside looks like. You're reading it for, I mean, you're reading a great Ran V story, but you're mostly reading it for this Christian Ward art. Uh, this is what I imagine it looks like underwater. Yeah. And if you tell me that it doesn't, I'm going to be really disappointed. <laughs> um... Up next, uh, GCPD, The Blue Wall. This is issue one. This is a Frankavilla cover. I love that DC has somehow roped Frankavilla into doing some incredible uh, variant covers for them. Uh, yeah. But this is all about the, the GCPD, which we're seeing a lot. We have a new Gotham Central book. We have a new, um, I think there's another, there's like three Gotham PD books right now. Um, the Rogues, issue four. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, this is... Um, all of the rogues gallery from basically the Flash universe, um, led by Captain Cold. They're all old. They all have retired, and they're all doing one last job, and that job is to rob Gorilla Grodd of all of his gold. It's been a while. It's been a while, and Joshua Williamson. So for you Flash fans that miss Joshua Williamson on the Flash, this is your way to get your fix, and it is it is beautiful. Josh, Joshua Williamson showing off. Uh, DC War of the Un Deceased War of the Undead Gods. If you missed your Tom Taylor Deceased, you are back, and this is on issue three of six. Um, DC Va versus Vampires All Out War. This is issue four of six. Um, if you want to know what Deathstroke and uh, Azrael are doing with Mary Marvel during all of the vampire drama that is going on, here's how you find out. A uh, spoiler alert: Azrael has ruined everything. Shocker to nobody at all. Um, Batman, One Bad Day, Penguin. This is the one shot for Penguin. Um, I know a lot of people are really looking forward to it because the Catwoman one is coming up soon, yeah. which is like Teeny Howard, and uh, it's going to be great. But, yeah. Um, Cats in America, Symbol of Truth, Issue 6. This is the Falcon side. This is the uh, Sam Wilson, Captain America. And this is the Jeff Landshark cover. I don't care what anybody says. The Jeff Landshark, co Landshark covers are the greatest thing that Marvel is doing right now. Um, Aliens, issue two, Alien, issue two. Goodness gracious. We have had a ton of Alien titles coming from Marvel. <laughs> They're great. It's just like the Alien movie franchise. I never know which one has an S and which one doesn't. Yeah. Uh, Avengers, issue 61. If you're keeping up with your Avengers story from Jason Aaron. Batman, the Knight from Chip Zdarsky. This is the end. That's it. 10 of 10. But don't be confused because Chip Zdarsky's actual Batman title is still it's ongoing. So good, yeah. uh, Batman's World's Finest from Mark Wade issue 8 is uh, dropping this week, which I hear everybody is loving. That is one of those series that people are just always clamoring for. Uh, Black Adam issue 5 of 12. Do not tell me anything about Black Adam in the comments. I don't want to know. Spoiler free zone. Haven't seen a trailer. Know absolutely nothing about it. Don't want to know about it. Gonna see it tomorrow in theory. I know you saw it. Don't spoil it. Um, I'm gonna ask you a secret question later on. Uh, I know Gus Simone said it was good. Um, Cap, uh, Catwoman issue 48 with this. Oh my God, the variants on Catwoman. They have been killing us from day one, issue one of this Catwoman series uh, with some incredible art. And I love the story of Teeny Howard on there. And I just ordered today, coming up soon, 
Catwoman versus Punchline. So Punchline mm. is coming back. We're going to talk about that in a second. Uh, Dark Crisis, Young Justice issue six, I believe, of twelve. Uh, five of six. Sorry, this is we're we're coming to the end of Dark Crisis. I have actually already ordered issue seven, which is the end of the main title of Dark Crisis. So that's that's gonna wrap up soon. Um, the Flash issue seven eighty seven. Uh, Harley Quinn, Legion of the Bat. This is another one that's connected to the animated series. So if you're watching that Harley Quinn animated series, you need to be getting these tie-ins to it from the comics, which I love. They, this is the second tie-in series for the animated series. They are trying to remind people who watch the show that you need to be in the, the comics too. Um, Iron Man issue 24. Christopher Cantwell is still continuing on that. Moon Knight 16. Judd McKay just writing a beautiful story. Nightwing 97. I love this Babs uh, dick cover made out of the city. It's been great. Um, Shang-Chi and the Ten Rings issue four and another Jethel Lanshark adorable cover. Jethel Lanshark's the best. Also, they did just announce, and this does not help comic book stores at all, but they did just announce a new wave of Jethel Lanshark. It's Jeff Unlimited on the Marvel Unlimited app stories are coming. Um, Kelly Thompson, you do, you girl, you just keep writing those beautiful, like, silent Jeff issues. They're wonderful. Uh, Deadly Neighborhood Spider-Man has finally launched. I had to tell a kid earlier this year that I had no idea if, when this comic was coming out. It's here, issue one, finally. Uh, Thor, issue 28, actually written by Al Ewing. This is Venom versus Thor. If you are, um, loving the Donny Cates Thor, this is really cool because and and the Al Ewing Venom, this is cool. It's got a crossover. Al Ewing is writing it um, with Donny on on plot, Al Ewing on script. Uh, Transformers Best of Grimlock. Uh, we've been getting these Best of Transformers books. Really excited about that. Um, X Force issue thirty three. This is another uh, Judgment Day tie in and X Men issue sixteen. We are still going with some X Men. It's crazy. Um, and then another book that we may or may not have in stock soon, but this is just really cool comic book news um, I wanted to throw in. This is Disciples AD, and it came to us, um, I believe the creator's name is in here, uh, Michael Siegel. This is a book that Phil and I will be reading to check out for next week. This is our first uh, self-published indie, like, small press book that's come to us in Bradenton. I'm very excited um, we had a lot of small press creators whose books we carried and who did a lot of events with us in Austin. So if you're in the Bradenton, Sarasota, even Tampa, St. Pete's, and you want to have your book like in our stores, we'd love to talk to you about what your books are and kind of bring you in for some events. Uh, so if you want to send us PDFs or you want to send us, bring us a copy, like this is the sample copy that we can check out from Michael. If you want to bring us a copy so we can check out your book, um, we'd love to kind of explore it, see what your book's about, um, figure out if it's something that people would love and we'd love to kind of just get to know your book. And so, um, all right, we got some trades. Um, something is killing the children volume five has hit the shelves finally. So if you want that volume, uh, issue 21 through 25 of something is killing the children, which you do, because that is, the core of what something is killing the children is going to be about this is all erica's backstory but also kind of gives us a lot about the order of saint george this is your chance to kind of um kind of jump in on that and figure it out honestly if you wanted to jump in on this volume this is going to give you your history um silver coin volume two is out this um as well i think came out last week but um we were waiting to see like if we had a copy so we do now um, another book out this week. I'm very excited about this. Uh, Radiant Black Volume 3 is out this week. Oh, wow. Check this out. Blurb from Will Friedle. Uh Said, actually, the book that brought him back to comic books. So, Batman Beyond Himself, brought mm. back to comics by Radiant Black. If you are like, hey, I don't know. I have a lot of people who are like, I've heard about a lot about Radiant Black. Should I jump in on it? Will Friedle says you should. This is Wilfred L. coming back. Um, I'm a big Eric Matthews fan from Boy Meets World, but, I mean, Batman Beyond. Right. He's He said it. And now I really just, you know, we had Paul Dano. We have Paul Dano writing a, a Riddler story coming up soon. I actually am like, hey, where's my where's my Batman Beyond story written by Wilfred L.? Um, Stop. I'm, I need it. 
I'm just saying. Or I write a book with Will Ferrell. That's all I'm just saying. Kim Possible. Where's my Ron Stoppable one shot from Will Friedle? I'd die. Look, we can't, we can't have it all. Some things have to be sacrificed. Was I'm, he on Kim Possible? He was Ron Stoppable. He was the voice of Ron Stoppable on Kim Possible. So if you want to do a one shot of Ron Stoppable, what he's, his life is like, written by Will Ferrell. Ron Stoppable is a question for later. He's the, he's the sidekick. <laughs> okay. Um, if you are ready to jump into Eve Volume 2, grab Eve Volume 1 from Boom. This is a great book. This is the entire first volume. Um, and then get your, get your spooky on. Uh, Hotel, this is Volume 2 from AWA, but the good thing is that Hotel is an anthology, much like Ice Cream Man. So if you want to see what would happen, um, if you had a creepy hotel stay where everything was, uh, crazy, this is actually kind of gives us a little bit more background to the hotel. I can't wait. Fingers crossed that there's a Volume 3 because the story was fantastic. Um, another fan favorite that's spooky is Stray Dogs. This is what would happen if Silence of the Lambs met the secret life of pets. Um, it is amazing. It's wonderful. Uh, it is not for children. Uh, and it is not, honestly, to if you are a person who cannot stand for dogs to be hurt, don't read this book. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you were good for the first couple issues and then you weren't. Um, and then lastly, great horror books. We talked about this earlier. Andrea Moody is coming Saturday. I cannot believe I'm still saying that. Like, it still, like, blows my mind that I'm saying Andrea Moody is coming to our store. This is a thing that I hoped would happen moving here, but I never thought would actually happen, like, for, like, a year or two. The fact that it's coming, shout out to Carrie from Suncoast, um, the Suncoast Comic Con for helping us get Andrea in here. But uh, if you need something to read for your spooky week, because Halloween is coming up a week from tomorrow, um, Bunny Mask Volume 1 is out. A lot of people have asked me, can they get one and two at the same time? We just did the order for two. You're still about three weeks to a month out for Volume Volume two, but if you want to read issues one through four, and I promise you, you do. Uh, this is a great way to get into that right now. Um, and if that's not your jam, and you really like slasher films, and you want to know what would happen if Jason had actually taken Manhattan, here is your chance to find that out with Maniac Harry, who is basically just Jason uh, taking Manhattan uh, in issues one through five of. Elliot Kalan and Andrea Moody's uh, Maniac of New York. This is fantastic. And this is going to be, they, Aftershock thing was there are more boroughs in New York we haven't as captured yet. So this ain't stopping anytime soon. Um, those are some of the trades we have in stock. I'm really excited about them. There's a lot more. If you want some good horror recs for this week, please stop by the store starting on Wednesday and let us know. Here's some uh, books that are coming out this week that are going to blow your mind. Um, Moon Knight has an annual coming out this week. Uh, Action Comics is back with issue 1048 because uh, Clark Kent's Kal-El, whatever you want to call him, has returned. Finally, we've been doing a return of him. He's finally back. Venom issue 12. Axe Judgment Day issue 6. That event should be wrapping up. Uh, DC vs. Vampires issue 10. Still just blown away how by how good that is. Um, uh, Batman Beyond the White Knight issue 6 is out this week. Strange issue 7. House of Slaughter issue 10. Human Target's come back recently. We're on issue 8 now. Riddler year 1. This is, this is the Paul Dano Riddler book. So if you want to know all about the Riddler that you see in the Batman and you want the actual actor who played it to write it, here it is. Riddler year 1. Vanish from Donny Cates and Ryan Segman issue 2 is out. This week, variants, uh, the Jessica Jones story issue four is out. You're not going to believe this. Catwoman, Lonely City, issue wow. four, finally out this week. Uh, I can't believe that. Uh, Exterminators issue two, Mighty Morphin Power Rangers 101. Tim Drake's new story, issue two comes out, Thunderbolts issue three. Strange Academy finals, we're wrapping up. We're on the final arc of Strange Academy, issue one is out this nice. week of that. Uh, Sergeant Rock vs. Rock the Army of Dead, written by Bruce Campbell. Issue 2 is out this week. Gotham Knights, Gilded City, um, out this week. Punchline, the Gotham game. I'm so excited, Punchline getting her own series out this week, written by Teeny Howard. Cannot wait to see how this goes. First time any, like, Sam Johns and, uh, 
Uh, James Tiny has been the only people to touch Punchline as a character so far, so I'm really excited to see somebody take on the Punchline mantle. Very, very excited. Um, and then we're also going to see Punchline appearing in the Catwoman story. So Teeny Howard is is fully embracing Punchline and taking her into all of her stories. Um, Chilling Adventures of Sorcery, issue one. Back looks like Madame Satan on the cover. For those of you Chilling Adventures of Sabrina fans, Eternal Descent from Opus Comics, issue one. Lovecraft Unknown, Kadath, number two. Um, Space Lady, issue four from Sumerian Comics. That has been just a, a stellar book all the way around. Uh, Godzilla, Best of Mothra, issue one. I expect that to be a pick of the week because I love my Mothra. Um, Caffeinated Hearts from Jonathan Hedrick with uh, Your Sweet Downfall Boy on art. Oh, Stefan um, Carcelli. Yes, uh, super excited to see that. Um, a Guardian number one, Action Journalism issue two, which we loved. Issue one, cannot wait to see issue two uh, from Oni Press. Uh, Justice Warriors number five, which is the next to last issue of Battle Hoy Comic. Uh, Mega Centurions issue four from Scout the Argus number one. Crash and Tro Troy issue three. Creep Show issue two, I'm sold out of issue one. Gonna have to look into getting more copies if you're if you haven't jumped on, but it's anthology, so you can jump on an issue two. Image number seven. I know a lot of people are getting ready for that future issue that's gonna include the new James Tynion story. Stuff of my Nightmare is issue two from R.L. Stein, Damn Them All number one, Barbaric Axe Grind number three, Armageddon Game number two. Love Sick number one. I got a lot of people waiting on that one. Uh, Rose Gallery issue four. Sins of the Black Flamingo wrapping up at issue five. New Think number five. Flawed number two. That was a pick of the week when it came out. So curious to see what happens in issue two. Absolution number four. Blink number four. Every issue of Blink has made it into the picks of the week. So can't wait to see what we find out with that one. Uh, Boogeyman number two, which was definitely a Shan pick of the week when it came out. Uh, American Jesus coming back again with Revolution. Revelation. Uh, Mr. Issa number one from... Uh, Scout Comics, Deadmaw number one, Sarah Lone number one from Sumerian, and Nightfall double feature from Vault Comics. The name of the imprint finally gets a title. Nightfall from Vault is coming back. It's got more than one story in it that will be ongoing stories, one of which features incredible art from Fan favorite at Bat City, Chris Sheehan. Cannot wait to see this story. We will have tons and tons of copies. If Chris puts their art into something, you know we're supporting it. Cannot wait to see this Nightfall double feature that's coming our way from Vault. Uh, uh, expect me to be wearing my Nightfall shirt next week. Clean or dirty. Don't care. Love that shirt. Love that imprint. It's going to be amazing. Uh, I'm so stoked for this book. This has been one I've been waiting for for a long time. Uh, Nightfall is the horror imprint from Vault, and it's finally getting a title. So excited. Um, that's what's coming out next week. We can't wait. We're going to be talking to you all about it next Sunday. Uh, mostly we're probably just going to be yelling about how Andrea Moody was here and we were freaking out all Saturday. Um, Andrea will be here from 12 to 3. The event itself for our Batastic Halloween will be running 11 to 4. Come get your free, um, how like your Halloween Batastic uh, comics. There is a Spidey and his Missing Friends comic for kids. There is an amazing Spider-Man issue. There is a Dr. Afra issue. There is a Godzilla issue. There is a Strange Academy one. I think it is the other, uh, the other reprint that they're doing. There's going to be face painting. There's going to be candy. There's going to be a story time with our special guest. Andrea Moody is going to be here doing autograph, uh, signings and, uh, and, and remarks. It's going to be amazing. There's going to be so much fun going on. Uh, watch the event space because there might actually even be a random pop-up cell. Uh, and Mez Games will be out with Pokemon cards. I'm so excited to have Mez on site. It's going to be amazing. I know Todd from Mez is coming out. I'm super stoked about that. Um, if we don't see you for this Wednesday, hopefully we will see you for this Saturday with all of the amazing stuff happening for Batastic Halloween. Um, and of course, we will see you right here next Sunday at 9 o'clock for Wind Down Your Weekend as we talk about all of those amazing comics we just named that Phil and I are probably going to have a terrible time picking picks of the weeks for. We'll see you then. Um, as always, this is Wednesday Phil. I'm Small Press Shan. Have a great re week. Happy reading. Bye, everybody.